first interview and I got the job. You know, I'd never seen this whole operation with the three cameras and the sets just stacked up side by side. And you just the cameras roll from one set to another and you just keep moving, you know, and, and you're doing, you know, 44 minutes of television a day in the can. You know, and when I do film work, you know, you might get two or three minutes of film in the can in a day. It's more like doing stage work. You know, you really got to have your stuff down. Occasionally they stop and reshoot a scene. But if they have to reshoot a lot of scenes, man, it gets too expensive. You know, you end up in those 12, 16 hour days and lots of overtime. So. One of the prerequisites is you got to be able to do it and do it fast. Now, remember, before we had wide use of videotape and stuff like that, in the 50s, I guess part of the 60s, they were doing those things live, like a play, with yeah. missteps and all. Yeah, that era had ended, thank God. You now, know, let me ask gone... you a fast question. Your yeah. departure from General Hospital, did they kill you off or what? No, no, I, I went off to Europe to console myself after one of my clients, I found her dead in her, in her apartment. So they, you know, they kind of truncated my storyline because there were various reasons. One is they brought a woman on board who was going to become my love interest, but she was so intimidated by the producer, Gloria Monti, that she could never relax on camera. She'd be fine in rehearsals, but the moment we get on camera and I'd say something to her and look at her, it was like looking into a deer in the headlights, you know, and she'd be lo looking for that line and kind of flattened out and just kind of desperate. And they kept waiting for her to relax. They gave her about six months. And they finally just flushed it. And when they flushed her, they flushed the guy who played her husband, who played my brother on the show. I had come on the show after them, but they said, okay, we're flushing that whole storyline. And they, they all got fired, and I ended up staying. I said, well, we'll just plug you in here and there because you know, we want to keep using you. But I just kind of dribbled around in the background until the end of my contract, and I got offered other contracts in New York City from other ABC soaps. And I went, you know what? I don't want to do any more soap. I decided to kick out, and that's when I started making money in commercials and then doing occasional guest star appearance on TV shows. And like Knott's Landing theater. and like The Bionic Woman, so you have a little genre connection there. Yeah. But if we are remembering the commercials of the 80s, and we'll get to your paranormal background in a moment, if we remember the commercials from the 1980s, what products will we remember your voice or face? With a beard, riding a bicycle, I was uh, in a commercial for the first commercial for Bud Light when they were introducing Bud Light. And it's another one of those showbiz stories where I, I just come off a of GH, I went with my wife to Aspen for three weeks to ski because she had a house there uh, that she co-owned with somebody else. And so we skied for three weeks. I let my beard grow. I came back to town. You know, okay, General Hospital's over. Now I've got to go out and find new work. And, you know, the beard was sort of like make sure you distance yourself from that character everybody sees you as. And my commercial agent said, you're dead with a beard. There's no work for you with a beard. There's no commercial work for you with a beard. Then uh, a request came along for somebody with bicycle riding experience for this Bud Light commercial. And they said, you're perfect for this, but you got to shave the beard. I said, well, I'm not going to shave it unless you get a call back or something. He said, well, they have never used a beard, Richard. Anheuser-Busch has never used a beard. I went, oh, well, okay. So I went on the audition, and uh, they taped me on a, on a stationary bike, you know, and throwing my hands in the air, crossing the finish line. Next thing I know, they're flying me up to Eugene, Oregon for four days of shooting. You know, you had to be really in shape because they tried to shoot this thing with professional bicycle races, but they couldn't get their quote-unquote performance out of them. So they sent back to L.A. They were already up there in the middle of production looking for a replacement actor. So I got flown up in the middle of it, had to jump right in. On the second day, after doing this hill climb four times with all the professional riders, <laughs> you know, the, the client from uh, the ad agency says, you know why you got the job? I said, no, the beard. <laughs> He said, we someone went, ah, that's it. <laughs> oh, boy. I love the irony. Yeah, that's, that's Hollywood, all, all the way down the line. Now, of course, Chris has been with and without beard. As far as I got was the mustache a long, long time ago in that other galaxy. Okay, Dang, Gene, that's, that's a scary thought. <laughs> me, me and a mustache, huh? <laughs> you know, it was the 70s. It's the cop look, man. It's the men at, men at work look, you know? That's right. You know, if you look at, you know, Mad Men or something, there it goes. Anyway, the paranormal. You've been an actor. You're a teacher now. How does the paranormal enter this game? Well, paranormal is not a term I would have used uh, when I got into this game. You know, getting into the game of the paranormal is more like trying to find things to explain your own experiences. A lot of people get into the UFO field because they're trying to go, well, what was that I saw? What, what, what was that happened? And I come from a family which... Uh, my mother was like that. My grandmother was like that. We'd have what they used to call second sight, you know. So throughout my growing up, I had interesting and, and weird experiences. Nothing I would relate to the uh, field of UFOs or abduction. But uh, when I first came to Hollywood in 1971, uh, after the Army and after going back to the University of Kansas, getting my degree in theater, came out here, you know, a degree in theater and a dollar would get you a cup of coffee. And, uh, you know, I was trying to pursue that. But at the same time, I was very interested in this. I'd also gone through, you know, 
like many of our generation, I'd explored other states of consciousness with drugs, uh, LSD and psilocybin and DMT. I'd, I'd kind of tasted a little bit of everything. I never pursued it like repetitively because I was very uh, cautious about it. I, was, I, you know, the experiences were intense, and uh, I didn't see it as a like a recreational thing. I saw it more as an investigation thing, and it was very draining. And uh, eventually, I, you know, after four or five or six experiences, I went, okay, that's good for me. You know, I left it alone. But uh, then, <laughs> then uh, over the next few years, the insights I'd gotten from that those experiences, the idea that so much is controlled by the way we perceive things. And how our mind runs through things, you know, and you watch his mind run when you're on a, on a psychedelic sometimes. Like if you see something a little bit scary and you pay attention to it, suddenly it blossoms into something really scary. And, uh, you know, experienced trippers would say, go with the flow, go with the flow, don't fight it. Because uh, if you fight it, it just intensified. If you, if, you, if you wrote it, it usually broke out into something else, you know. That's one thing I discovered. So it helped me examine how, how I operated, so to speak. And uh, then I began to, uh, leaving drugs behind, I began to really pursue a kind of a spiritual path of, uh, through the Edgar Casey Foundation, ARE. And uh, I eventually started a study group that met once a week in my house. And about five or six would meet, and we'd do the little Search for God study program, which involved choosing a focal point every week or something you're going to work on, like cooperation or uh, meditation, or something like this. And you'd have a little theme for the week, and you'd try to apply it. The next week, come back and say how it went. I'll tell you what, that's fine how this goes, Okay. Richard yep. Saradet joining Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. Hey, neighbors, you've seen all those crazy, wacky products on TV. The perfect tortilla, easy covers, hot booties, furniture fix, petty spin, and more. Where do you find all that stuff? You go to AsSeenOnTV.com because this is the one-stop source for all of these TV goods advertised. Find all your favorites as seen on TV. Check them out as SeenOnTV.com. And by the way, save 10%. Here's what you do. Use the code SEEN1, S-E-E-N number one, SEEN1. Go to AsSeenOnTV.com to order. Save 10%. Purchase this summer's hottest as seen on TV items. Save 10%. Or call 1 866 2773 The code SCENE1 to save 10%. Good day. Jim Newcomer from Midas Resources, October 5th, 2012. Gold opened this morning at 1791.80. A one ounce gold coin can be purchased for 1835.80, 917.90 for a half ounce, or 458.95 for a quarter ounce. That's 1835.80, 917.90, and 458.95. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? Wait a sec. Gold and silver is going up while Congress is trying to settle on the next debt increase. And there's no end to this madness. That old 401k and IRA can be converted into physical gold without tax consequences. I explain this in my book, 10 Reasons to Buy Gold. Don't let time slip away. Call for your free copy today, 800-686-2237. Get away from that Washington spin and get honest answers about gold. 800-686-2237. The book is free, 800-686-2237. Digestive health is the key to wellness and elimination of toxins. That bears repeating. Digestive health is the key to wellness and elimination of toxins. And Pro-EM-1 Daily Probiotic Cleanse is the key to digestive health. Pro-EM-1 is a powerful liquid probiotic, strong enough to cleanse, gentle enough to use every day. Pro-EM-1 is dairy, wheat, and soy-free, contains all natural and certified organic ingredients, contains no preservatives or animal products, supports a healthy digestive and immune system, supports weight loss, improves absorption of food nutrients, aids in controlling yeast infections, is never freeze-dried, and uses three groups of live, viable, beneficial microbes to cleanse and remove toxins. Order Pro-EM-1 Daily Probiotic Cleanse at Terraganics.com, spelled T-E-R-A-G-A-N-I-X.com, Terraganics.com. Or call toll-free 866-369-3678. That's 866-369-3678. Pro-EM-1, the raw probiotic. What's safer and cheaper than prescription drugs? Glad you asked. 
The answer is Renovation Teas. Herbal remedies are much safer and much cheaper than prescription drugs. Taste great, and most importantly, herbal teas are effective and non-addictive. Renovation Tea is especially unique, and here's why. We spent years researching herbs and their beneficial properties. Renovation Teas uses only 100% organic, fair trade herbs. Our teas are blended towards specific ailments and health conditions, such as diabetes, blood pressure, anxiety, libido, detox, and much more. All renovation teas are formulated and hand-filled in Arkansas. Take care of yourself naturally, the way Mother Nature intended. Order renovation teas at renovationtea.com or call 870-784-3121. That's 870-784-3121. Renovation teas. Renovate your health one bag at a time. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. We're back with the quiet researcher himself, Richard Saradet, joining Gene and Chris on the Paracast. You've heard Richard on Dark Matters Radio, Radio Mysterioso, and all other places like that. But I want to find out, before we get into the main subject of our session, this phrase, the quiet researcher, from where did it originate? I think it comes from the fact that uh, I met Greg uh, way back uh, in the early 90s when I was working very, very closely with UFO Magazine with Donna Vicky. Don and I had partnered. I'd, I'd approached him and made a deal to say, look, let's, I want to develop projects for film and television around this subject. And uh, I've been reading your magazine, and you guys are good, and you're the only game in town. <laughs> so uh, we partnered, and then Don and I developed uh, ideas for a show. Actually, we developed what you see as UFO hunters today. We really developed uh, that kind of concept way back in the early 90s. And then we were out pitching it, for like 32 episodes, and we put them out there, and we were just ahead of the curve, uh, you know, the, the pitching to the producers and pitching to the networks. I'd get the meetings, we'd go in, they'd be fascinated, they'd ask for more information, and then we'd never hear from them again, you know. Uh, now, this is the way Hollywood works. Yeah. and so They I, seem to be interested in the concept. You go there and you do what is called the pitch, which is some kind of super sales job, right? Right. Okay. But you never really know what's going to happen. Is there any way to read? Yeah, you know what's going to happen. They're going to rip off your good idea and run with it. Well, there is that. Well, yeah, and that's actually exactly what happened, Chris. That's exactly what happened to Don and I, and it was very frustrating. But, you know, it's sort of like, uh, this sounds a little bit like the embittered guy, and uh, maybe it is a little bit. It's like there's a kind of an informal club uh, of people at the top, and it's like if they want you in the club, they let you in. If they don't, they just take what they want from you and, and move on, you know, and this is the experience of most people in Hollywood. I have several friends who are screenwriters who have just been directly ripped off, and I mean by even by Spielberg's outfit, Dreamland, you know. Uh, DreamWorks, they'll just take a script, one of the sub-producers, not necessarily Spielberg himself. My friend had sold him one script for you know, $350,000, and then he, they started hiring him as a script fixer. And then he submitted another one of the scripts to one of their producers. Uh, the guy returned in about a week and said, no, I'm not interested. In the following weeks, he sees the script with the small alterations. It was just sold. He saw it in variety. Two DreamWorks by this producer for a million dollars. And he was like, well, wait a minute, that's my script. So he contacts his, his uh, manager and says, hey, blah, blah. and the response was very interesting. They go, well, yeah, we're not going to go. We're not taking them on. You know, we're, we're not, uh-uh. no, we got to have a relationship with those guys. If we, if we do that, we'll never get any ends there again. I want to ask a question here. As I understand it, because I've written treatments myself on a few occasions, very few, and you see where they went. I've written some treatments. You register this information at the Writers Guild, right. which is the Writers Union. Supposedly, if you do that, the concept is copyrighted. For writers, they shouldn't steal it. That right. doesn't stop them. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's just the big boys get their way. That's the way it is. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. the irony here, though, that you and Don come out with an idea of something like a UFO Hunters type of show in the 90s, and we look at Don being involved with UFO Magazine, then he sells it off to Bill Burns, who then, with the people he worked with, sold the idea of UFO hunters. Any direct connection or what? Uh, I, we don't know. We really don't know. Because part of the purchase of the magazine, a lot of the material that you know we had got turned over. I don't know if the copies of R&D Productions material got turned over them or not. But, uh, you know, they, they were covering all the same territory. We were, we were, you know, we had 32 episodes outlined plus a, another couple of paragraphs saying other things we could develop, you know. And 
you don't know. You just don't know. I mean, we saw a lot of our topics covered by UFO hunters, and our concept was, was, was quite a bit different. It was kind of a hybrid between being an in-studio and then a segment would be in the field, you know, that kind of thing. And we would have periods of the show where we'd recount or follow up on stories we told before or an ongoing investigation. And we hope to pick up some real field investigators like a Christopher O'Brien, you know, who could become like an expert and a, a field reporter for us on a particular thing. And you wouldn't take like the work that Chris does, the admirable, wonderful work that Chris does, and move it to a different city like UFO Hunters did. Well, you know, we, the way we would do it, we, we, we would have a, we had a, in our budget an RV remote kind of uh, unit that we could go out in the field and uh, shoot and record and even broadcast live from there. That was part of the concept. and that was gonna- Yeah, but then once you get something, you yeah. would take it back to the studio and analyze it. I mean, this new show, uh, Chasing UFOs, in the first episode, they got this pretty compelling footage, and that was the last you ever heard of it. I mean, to me, that's ludicrous. It is. It is ludicrous, it's, it, and it's what happens when you approach Hollywood with a show that you know like this. It's like they have these ideas in their head about what sells, and you're in the middle of a pitch, and you're pitching an idea, and they start interrupting you, like, "Well, can we can, can we make that into a younger woman and make it a love interest? Maybe we can get who's hot right now? Yeah, we'll get Kim Bassinger to do that part. And, you know, you go, wait, wait, but but that's a real character. But, oh, well, it doesn't matter. You know, so you just got to let go of the idea that you can accomplish something significant. Because they're going to turn it into what they think is going to get rating, and you have no control. So you just got to decide to live with it and take the paycheck or get out. Really sucks, pardon the expression, is that 95% of the people that work on these shows in the research departments, the uh, in post-production, the, the crews that go out in the field, the field producers, the directors, they don't have a clue about the subject matter. And, and that, that is so frustrating. I just did a shoot a couple of days ago, all day, with ancient aliens. And I'm, <laughs> I'm telling you, it's like trying to take a blind person and have them read an eye chart or a deaf person and try to start putting tones in their ears. Uh, it, there's a major disconnect between the machinations and the machine that creates this, this programming and uh, the actual subject matter. It, it, to me, it's really disheartening. It is disheartening because you're really operating on uh, two different uh, value systems, and you're seeing a clash of value systems. Well, the thing also is that the way Hollywood views it is from the MBA viewpoint of it being product to sell. This is product to sell. How do we alter this product in a way that will get the largest audience, the largest audience in the demographics they have to reach, which is what, 25 to 49 or something like that? Yeah, and it's all broken down like that, and they've got to jump through a lot of hoops and uh, prove to the uh, networks that there's enough interest to generate enough eyeballs in front of the TV set for them to even take an interest in it. And don't forget also, with the amount of channels we have now on cable and TV being the monster that never sleeps, you've got to have product to put on the air if you want to keep your license. So you got to get anything up there. Like the first two years of Sci-Fi Channel, when they finally got their cable channel, and I had talked to them, they were very interested in our stuff, but they said, you know, we already blew our budget for the next two years, you know, buying packages of old reruns like the old Battlestar Galacta, Galactica, the old V-series. And they were just putting that stuff in the air to kind of get the channel going while they try to develop their own material. And the guy said, well, contact us in about two years, and maybe we can do something. By that time, I had to go out and, and, and earn a paycheck. Well, you know, it's funny. With all the garbage that goes on TV, there are some shows I like. I like some of the stuff on Sci-Fi Channel. Me some too. of it is really fun. Some of it is really nicely done. And we know the audiences, they grab it nowhere near what the big networks get. But... They have some nice stuff, and there are really good creative people working. But yeah. trying to do something different, like a UFO show, within the Hollywood system, is just impossible. And we look at the experience of chasing UFOs, where they've got one guy there, James Fox, who's a dedicated UFO researcher, has done good documentaries, really good work. The fellow is honest to a bone, as far as I can tell. I mean, I've had conversations with him since... The show went on the air, and he's yeah. very unhappy about how things turned out. He's yeah. hoping to work from within the system to make it better, especially if it goes to a second year. But you have gone through the Hollywood system more than any of us. You know we can wish him luck, but it's not going to turn out. Richard Saradet joining us with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network.
If you want to get your website online and you need reliable service, first class service at the lowest possible price, there's only one place to go. Well, DreamHost has a special promotion with our show where they'll offer you unlimited disk space, unlimited bandwidth, one click web app such as WordPress, 24 7 support. You can save over $55. You want to know how? Go to dreamhost.com slash radio, dreamhost.com slash radio. Fate Magazine provides true reports of the strange and unknown. Keep up with the latest on angels and miracles, psychic phenomena, ghosts, UFOs, life after death, and much, much more. To receive your free issue of Fate Magazine, call now at 1-800-728-2730 or visit their website at www.fatemag.com. That's 1-800-728-2730. What are you waiting for? Your fate awaits. That's the sound of your door being kicked in by an intruder with a single kick. That's the sound of the same door now protected by the Door Sentinel at MySafeDoor.com. Go to MySafeDoor.com right now and watch the amazing video. At MySafeDoor.com, you'll learn how to turn your home into a fortress with the Door Sentinel. 16 kicks later, and the Door Sentinel is still holding strong. MySafeDoor.com. That's MySafeDoor.com. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. Do you owe the IRS money that you can't pay? Are tax liens and levies ruining your life? Are you tired of being afraid just to go to the mailbox? If this describes you, then Dan Pilla can help. Hi, I'm Dan Pilla, and I've been solving tax problems for more than 30 years. In fact, I wrote the book that made it possible to negotiate settlements with the IRS, and I've helped thousands of people do exactly that. Call now at 800-346-6829 to learn how I can help you. You know your IRS debt will not go away by itself, but you don't have to live in fear anymore. New changes to IRS policies will help more people than ever before eliminate their debts once and for all. There's no need for you to suffer another day with IRS debt. Call 800-346-6829. I can help you eliminate wage and bank levies, release tax liens, and negotiate a settlement with the IRS that will put your tax nightmare behind you forever. Call 800-34-NO-TAX or go to my website, TaxHelpOnline.com. That's TaxHelpOnline.com. 25 years is reason to celebrate. Cash in on October deals during the 25th anniversary of Emergency Essentials. Going on now, save 26% off clarified butter, 24% off honey oat granola, and save 50% off a kitchen fire extinguisher. A must for any kitchen emergency. Stock your car with a RoadWise Emergency 72-hour kit, only $34.99 at BePrepared.com. New this month, two varieties of Mountain House just-in-case buckets. Your favorite Mountain House pouch is packed in a convenient bucket. Find a super deal this month only for the Goal Zero Lighthouse LED Lantern and Nomad 7 Solar Panel. ISAT Potassium Iodide Tablets are on sale. And as always, check out the Emergency Essentials Group Specials now through October 31st. Call 800-999-1863 for exceptional customer service and Emergency Essentials low price guarantee. That's 800-999-1863. The choice is clear. Be unprepared or be prepared.com. Hi, this is Don Ecker, and you are tuned into the Paracast. Let me tell you what, you're going to hear stuff here that you probably won't hear anywhere else. Hear that, George Snorri? We find that although he is the quiet researcher, Richard Saradet has a lot to say with Gene and Chris on the Paracast. Let's look at some of the things that you've embraced over the years and covered. And one of them is the late Dr. Carla Turner. Now, just so people will understand, she died back in 1996, I guess a year after my brother died, as a matter of fact. She was only 48 years old. And you think of the age 48, and that's not even middle age anymore because Chris is a little bit older than that. Richard and I are a lot older than that, and we're still here. So we do know that Dr. Turner was a UFO abduction investigator and also 
labeled as a human rights activist? How so? Well, you know, she's a remarkable individual. By the way, her doctorate is in old English studies. Now, you talk about a, a you know, a, a kind of a small little area to be a, a, a PhD in. And she was teaching at North Texas State in Denton. She has a very interesting personal history, uh, more so than myself, of having, you know, uh, I guess what you term today paranormal experiences, visions, dreams, communications, uh, things like that. She had a whole history of that. So she even tells a story, and I was trying to find it, and I haven't found it yet in, in one of her books, about this weird journey she took to India. And I forget the details, and I'm trying to find it. I was trying to find it for this morning. And it was like she was being guided there by visions and dreams and just told to go and then take a bus here and you stand there and somebody would come and, you know, she just kind of went, well, what the hell? I'm, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. And she ended up being guided to a monastery and having some interesting, weird experience up there, meeting a guru. And then she's, you know, all this happens, by the way, something that doesn't even belong in the time sequence, the linear frame of her life. It just kind of happens and she returns like all this time passed and when she comes back, no time had passed. It's very strange. So she was already out there in, in her world experiences, and hers weren't the average person's experiences. Now, is there a connection between that and that, that, that it became targeted for these experiences, which to this day I can't vouch for where they come from or who's doing it or what's doing it, uh, but that it's, it's actually a manipulation, that there's something being done, it's happening from outside you coming into you, of that I'm convinced. Uh, how much of it is extraterrestrial or, or crypto-terrestrial or whatever you want to call it, and how much of it is sophisticated technology still remains a very, very significant question. And I tell you, over the years, I think one of the reasons they call me the quiet researcher is because one of the things I learned early on, and back going back to uh, even before I met Don and Vicky, was as I was very, very interested in kind of understanding this from a personal point of view. I, and even before, for years before I contacted Don and Vicky, I was doing my own reading and research, and I discovered there weren't as many books available. I discovered Jacques Vallée, and he very much shaped my thinking because his thinking seemed to reflect a little bit of what I'd kind of come to from my own experience, that this is much more complicated and not nearly as simple as being a simple you know, extraterrestrial hypothesis. It's much more complicated and much more intimate uh, than that. It's very vexing, and I, I, I don't think we'll ever totally understand it. Uh, but in order to try to get information, I found the best way is to have a big set of ears and a very small mouth. And just kind of cruise around and, and, and be discreet and talk to people and don't make a big deal out of it. And what I sought out, I always sought out direct experience. You know, like I wanted to, I wanted to see if there was something worth pursuing myself. So I always like to go out and participate or experience or get in the field and, and see if I could find what was going on rather than just reading about it in books. What I found was that even with all this research, even with all the effort I put into it, I, I couldn't say I, I could give you an, a, a black or white answer on any of this stuff. I have lots of clues. And over the time, I talked to a lot of people who worked in aerospace engineers, uh, retired people, old military people. I would just I just talk to everybody. And uh, I just kind of hang in the background at UFO conferences. I would hang in, on the fringes. And I would, you know, and then if I want to talk to somebody, I would just kind of run into them and maybe chat and and just kind of like, just trying to stay low profile, trying to stay invisible and just try to gather information, you know, and it was mostly because I wanted to know. Uh, and uh, even after all our attempts to get TV stuff going with Don and Dicky, you know, Don and I had to go on uh, various paths and, and make our livings. And I had to go and, you know, support my now growing family. My, my passion for it remained and my uh, list of contacts, people I, I, I sought out information from, you know, quietly grew. And, uh, uh, it was just, again, I was I was looking for myself. I wasn't at this point looking to produce anything or make money off it. I just wanted to know, you know, so that's how I went about it. Okay, so moving towards Dr. Turner. Yeah. Explain right, about so her life and her research. And was there any reason to suspect her death? Yeah, I think there is significant reason to suspect her death. I really do. Um you know, one of the things, and I, as far as who, what, what might have been involved in that, that's another very big question. You know, was this a result of some sort of a, a medical experiment where they're taking people and trying to alter something in them, and maybe they they haven't perfected it, and there are certain side effects? You know, the fact that she died of liver cancer, it doesn't seem like a, you know, a targeted way to kill, but it could be the byproduct of a, some experiment done on her or whatever. I actually was asked, that's how I got in touch with her initially, is that while I worked with Don and Vicky, I said, you know, I'd love to, like, you know, really write for the magazine. And, uh, you know, I haven't written in many years, but it'd be fun. So Vicky said, well, you could do a book review. 
So I did a book review on uh, Crash at Corona, which they thought was good enough to publish. And I did another one. I forget what it was. And then she said, well, here's the book we got, Into the Fringe. You want to read this and maybe write a review? I said, sure. So I took it home and read it and was like, have you read Into the Fringe, either of you? Have you read it? I haven't read it, no. Uh, I did years ago um, after I met Carla. What do you think of it? Her, her story is so, you know, in many ways over the top. But, but having met her in... in I saw how passionate and how focused and how, you know, obviously bright and intelligent she was. I, I definitely had to, uh, you know, that, that tempered my, my suspension of disbelief in, in some sense, but, but it, I was impressed. Yeah, I, I think that, I would, that mirrors exactly what my reaction to her was. Chris. Richard, I'd like you to actually explain more about the book to our listeners. Sure. What is the story here? What is the main focal point? All right, this, uh, and I'll tell you, uh, since he went to all the trouble to write it on the back cover, I'll I'll read it to you. Here is my husband, a man of intelligence and great analytic ability, telling me about two different childhood encounters with non-human beings. For Carla Turner began the spring of 88, but it had in reality begun much earlier. Two months before, our lives were normal. Yet, here we were, being followed in the middle of the night, having spent the evening actually considering the absurd possibility that alien beings had somehow touched our lives. We didn't realize at that time just how deeply and irrevocably they would change our world. Dr. Turner, her husband, her child, there would be sudden shocking discoveries of long buried memories, as well as actual physical evidence of ongoing intrusion, the marks on their bodies, the sightings, the missing time episodes. Quote, sometimes I still try to pretend that it was all in our imagination. It wasn't in their imaginations. It was real. And it's all here in this most chilling, convincing account of alien contact since communion. Now, uh, I think the most, for me, Having read it, and uh, after I read a book, I would call the author and say, okay, I wrote a review, let me read it to you, and then we can discuss it and see if there's anything you want to say about it. And so I did that. And you know how engaging she is, Chris. We ended up talking like for a couple of hours on the phone and then arranging to get in touch again. And then it turned out, I think the spring of 92, there was a a conference, uh, traditional every year, run by Lou Farish, a UFO conference at Eureka Springs, Arkansas. Any of you been to that one? That's where I met Carla, actually. Yeah, was it then, back in 92? or? Uh, no, it was in 94, if I remember. I think it was the last time she was there. Maybe she had been there in 95. Uh, I forget, but I was there from 94, 5, 6, 7, and I think 98. Were you there? I'm trying to remember the exact year. I think for me it was 92, but I'm not sure. It could have been 93, and it could have been 94, because I've, I've dug out the notes. But uh, that was the year that Leah Haley introduced herself at that conference. Was that the one you were at with John Mack and Leah Haley and John Carpenter? I think it may have been the year after that. Okay. I think 94 was my first year. Well, it seems to me the, year, the focus of that conference was usually the abduction phenomena. On our previous episode of the Paracast, we featured Mike Barra talking about lunar and Martian mysteries. Well, coming next week, we're going to look at a counterpoint from a former TV producer with expertise in space travel known as Expat. That's the name he's going to go by next week. We will continue with Richard Saradet. He is a quiet researcher, and we're talking about the life and times of Dr. Carla Turner. Dr. Turner was a UFO abduction researcher, but also someone who had herself been abducted. With Gene and Chris, you're in Shh, the Paracast. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. We also have swag. You know, we have all these exclusive Paracast things that you can buy. We've got like, I guess, 60 or so different items. And entails T-shirts, sleeves for notebook computers. Uh, Medical uh, experiments. I mean, some of them don't even reflect the state of uh, our technology now. Some of them seem actually medieval. So to me, there's, this is a real morass of uh, possibly you know, frontal lobe, lobe epilepsy, uh, you know, sleep paralysis. I mean, there's all sorts of possible prosaic explanations that can, you can factor into this. But at the core of this, I think there is truly something going on. And Carla and Leah um, impressed me as two women, very, very bright, very, you know, astute, very observant, 
who I think really had actual things going on. And, and Carla really impressed me, and it was, I was very saddened um, when we lost her. It was heartbreaking. It was, it was just sad because she knew she was dying, and we all knew she was dying. And it was, it was just really, really uh, difficult. And it infuriated you because you didn't know, you didn't know, you know, and you, and you saw that you were going to lose this, this amazing person. And she was a born leader. Was she ill for a while? Uh, yeah, well, uh, she, it didn't show for a while. She, you know, you could see her deteriorate. And the thing is, we knew she was dying. She knew she was dying. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was just hard to sit back and watch it as she drove herself and drove herself. She never stopped pushing herself. She was driven to understand this thing and driven to, to kind of like, like ring a fire bell. Uh, I think one of the things that she brought to the field, if you've seen her or heard her speak, she's very fiery and she's a, a, a very quick thinker. Um, and she has no patience for fools. Uh, at the same time, you know, she, her mind was open to, to unconventional possibilities because there was no conventional possibilities that could possibly explain what she and her family were going through. And uh, Into the Fringe, I think, is a perfect title for the book because, man, this is some fringy stuff. And it's just an account, just a personal account. And it was so harrowing and bizarre uh, that you don't know quite what to make of it. Uh, so I wrote the best review I could, and when I talked to her, again, her passion, uh, the immediacy of, uh, uh, of her experiences that was still going on at the time, uh, uh, led me to fly out there in conjunction with the, the, the conference taking place that spring. And I arrived uh, at Little Rock Airport. At this time, they had moved from North Texas to Little Rock because her husband had a job offer there to work for a computer software firm. He had previously been in the Army Security Agency, the same thing I enlisted for when I was drafted. And uh, he had served in, uh, he was very bright, he had served in computer software development in the military. Uh, and he now is working for private companies. He's a very soft-spoken, very quiet, very uh, almost nerdish guy, uh, if you meet him. Uh, very, very nice man. Very easy to be around. And uh, uh, created a nice sort of, I think, balance to Carla's intensity. So she picked me up at the airport and uh, drove us back to her place. And her place is uh, right outside of Little Rock in, in a wooded area. And uh, you just turn off this uh, little highway, uh, and there is a a road down to their house, which is about three or 400 feet in, and they just cut, cut the trees away. So there was this road. Then they cut the trees away for a clearing where they had built their house. The front of the house was at ground level. The back of the house was uh, with a drop off of about uh, four or five feet to a backyard, which had been cleared. So behind the house is a big cleared area with grass and, and stuff, but around it and behind it were all tall trees and woods. And the her backyard slanted down uh, several hundred yards into a completely wooded draw, and then the, the, the rose up on the other side in the distance. There was like a, a higher wooded hillside. The reason I'm describing this is what I'm going to tell you right now. Sure. Right next to the house they built for, for herself and her husband, her son was now not living at home because he was college age, but, you know, he had a room there. And um, they built a little mother-in-law house for, for Elton's mom, uh, just about, you know, 40 feet away, a much smaller house. Well, you come down the driveway, and to the left is the mother-in-law house. To the right is the, the main house. And uh, so we, uh, you know, I got to meet the mother-in-law. And she was describing some of the weird things they had encountered there, and the mother-in-law uh, had also seen them. One of the things they were seeing, and this is just so bizarre, is coming out of this draw, just out of, the, like, seems like from behind, the, down there in the draw sometimes, these rectangular shaped black box cars would move with little lights in the corners would move up out of there and just go right over their heads, you know, and out of the property. Now, when they moved to Little Rock area, how they found that property is another whole bizarre story involving these beings that showed up at our house back in Denton, Texas, that looked like the old MIB stories, these like 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 the old character with the uh, you know, these, uh, they look dead, you know, they're, 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 they're pale, they look old, they're, they're wrinkled, they're, they're kind of beat up, they're, the clothes don't fit, they, they don't seem to know appropriate uh, manners or anything else. And these two beings uh, claimed that, that they had animated these bodies just to use them temporarily to communicate messages to them. <laughs> this is the kind of stuff she was going through. And they advised her to move from where she was. And when the offer came for the job, they said, okay, everything's pointing in that direction, let's go. And somehow, I don't get the details, but this property was found with the help of these two weird beings that, would, that showed up at Carla's once or twice. And how strange is that? How fringy can you get? 
that's pretty that's- strange. I, you, you know, Richard, I have a, a question from one of our forum posters, Chicane, who's been a member at forum.theparacast.com for about two years. And he asks, I hope I'm not too late to ask this, but Carla's book was one of the first I've read on UFOs and on the abduction topic. One of which made quite an impression was Masquerade of Angels. Absolutely. I, I enjoyed reading that book, but actually I tend to see it more as a novel than a real story due to the incredible, some may say insane, material it contains. So his question to you is, um, do you know if this is a real or a fictional story? And if it's real, do you know the real identity of the main character of the story? And he puts in parentheses, Ted Rice, I believe. It's been a long time since he's read the book, so he doesn't recall. If so, what is he or she doing now? That I don't know because um, uh, Carla Carla was determined to protect his identity. But, uh, you know, I talked to her extensively about that book. And by the way, Chikani, I have that book right next to me right now, uh, and I brought it for this conversation because I think that book has a lot to uh, teach us to consider about what we call the abduction phenomena and uh, your interpretation of what's going on for you. Uh, any, uh, if you've read the book, have, have you read that book, Masquerade of Angels? It's been a while. I did, uh, but uh, I, I, it's always struck me as one of my favorite titles uh, of a book about the UFO phenomenon. Yeah, <laughs> and I think the book really, really will turn people on their head, much like uh, Valet is saying, or Kiel is saying. You know, you, you do you accept it all at face uh, face value? Uh, the book. At face value, you mean the, uh, how she writes this novelistic book about Ted's experiences based on her interviews and conversations with him? I have to take it at face value since I didn't get a chance to interview the guy himself. I'm, I'm relying on the fact that I consider uh, Carla a woman of integrity uh, who's not trying to pad but trying to reflect. But, of course, it's being filtered through a human mind and her mind as best she can. So, no, there's no absolute way of determining that. Uh, do I buy it? I, I, I buy it in the same provisional sense. You buy anything that comes as a report to you. I'll uh, tell you what, we've got so much more to talk about. We're discussing this all with Richard Saradet, focusing on the life and times of Dr. Carla Turner, who died, what, 16 years ago, an abductee and abduction researcher. A lot more to come. With Gene and Chris, you're in The Paracast. <laughs> The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. GCN. Great talk radio starts here. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you'd like to listen to GCN programs on the go, I have great news. GCN has created a Droid and iPhone application, and it's free. Just as easy as going to GCNlive.com, click on the banner and download. Before you know it, you'll be listening to your favorite hard-hitting GCN shows, live or on demand, right on your Droid or iPhone, 24-7 and on the go. So download the Droid and iPhone app free by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Thanks again for listening to GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. We the people grow cotton, weave fabric, engrave ink, embed strips and fibers to protect from counterfeit, then carting to a private bank, having it led back at interest, forcing taxes to service debt. This capitalism, or was Jefferson correct when stating a central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army? Ted Anderson, I'm placing a free silver dollar in a book that explains our monetary system. Call for your copy, 800-686-2237. It's time to understand the system. Call 800-686-2237. That's 800-686-2237. Hey, this is Steve Schultz, and you've been hearing top radio personalities talk about longevity and how people are getting healthy and making an income at home. You see, I've built a seven-figure income by just following this simple program to success, and I'm putting on a free seminar to share the secret with you. Now, think about this. Do you know anyone that wants to lose weight or maybe get healthy? How about saving money on items that they're already purchasing and get paid while they do it? Of course you do. The system is so simple, and it works. Don't miss my 90 for Lifestyle Tour, Tuesday, October 9th, 6.30 p.m. at Scott Highlands Middle School in Apple Valley, Minnesota. Or you can call 877-279-9422. Hundreds of thousands of people are already working the simple system, and you should too. That's Tuesday, October 9th, 6.30 p.m. at Scott Highlands Middle School in Apple Valley, Minnesota. Call 877-279-9422. Again, that's 877-279-9422. Welcome. 
Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. In case you missed the first part of the show, ladies and gentlemen, the reason that Chris whispers the stinger, the Paracast, is because Richard Saradet is the quiet researcher. Let me ask you a quick question about Dr. Turner. What was her take on what caused her abductions? Was it folkloric or UFO, ET, physically based? Well, that's why I give her a lot of credit, because she never came down on one side or the other. And, and if you watch her speeches, she's very uh, kind of uh, uh, forthright about that. But her opinion is, trying to look at it like you or I have looked at everything else, is like, in a person like Carla Turner, she can only deal with what she knows. Uh, I think her integrity is high. Uh, I think she never came down on one side or the other, that this was uh, the abduction phenomena was what it appeared to be or not. But her opinion was you can't trust anything. You can't trust the hypnosis. You can't trust anything. You can trust hypnosis to an extent, but there is layers and layers of deception here. Like we don't have a bottom line answer for this, and this is what drove her. And she was very adamant about not letting people just come to a conclusion, and she avoided coming to a conclusion about herself. At the same time, she was highly dependent on hypnotic regression for a lot of the information she developed. But the hypnotic regression was done in conjunction with certain experiences they were having and marks appearing on their bodies, which tended to lean her towards something's going on here that's really physical and going on. Is it alien? Is it military? Is it something else? The same questions I had when I met her. And, and uh, from there to the time she died, she never came down one way or the other on it, except that there's something very manipulative going here. It's probably much more profound and difficult. And that's where it got left, I think, even when she died. Now, just getting into more of this here, her death, liver cancer, is anyone theorizing that something in her experiences, especially if she underwent physical examinations by some force or other, might have helped hasten this? Yeah, there is that suspicion. Again, it's just a suspicion, you know. Because for her, it kind of came up suddenly, but then liver cancer can come up suddenly. You know, these things happen. We'll, we'll never know. Basically, we'll never know, I don't think. Uh, and she's not the only one who's, who's had a, a uh, strange and kind of sad death at an early age in this UFO field, as you know. And if I kind of also wonder, Richard, if today she had a condition like that, she was still with us, whether a liver transplant would have taken care of it. Obviously, medical science is much more capable of dealing with with these yeah. things. Yeah, timing is everything. It really is. In my opinion, I think Carla, uh, having visited her house and, the, and what I saw there and, and what I saw in their yard and what I saw in the uh, uh, experience in the house and what I saw as far as her little Polaroids that she showed me, they would take pictures of the marks in their bodies the morning after they thought they had an experience or they woke up with blood on the pillows or, or gravel and dirt and leaves and twigs in, in the bed, and, you know, their clothes on inside out and not knowing any memory of what had went gone on, you know, that they were experiencing all these things. Now, you, you know, I, I tended to, to like cut to the simplest scenario. I was more inclined to think this was some kind of manipulation by a human agency or maybe even, uh, you know, experiments being done uh, a la uh, black ops, you know, so there was that be considered. When you talk about her experiences with the so-called man in black, that leads you in that direction also. Now, I maybe didn't understand the answer here. Okay, she was told by the MIB she had to move. And she moved to this rural Arkansas home. Yeah. Is that the location they pointed her to? I, as I recall, and I will have to check on this, but my recollection is that, yeah, they kind of guided her to this property. Why listen to them? I always wonder about that. I you know. have some kind of being that says, do this, do that, do the other thing. And one of the things we like to talk about in the UFO field is the possibility of deception. When strange beings, higher beings, whatever, tell you to do something... Why not just say, hey, forget it, go away? <laughs> I'd do I the exact her, opposite. Yeah, I think for her, it wasn't, I mean, it's bizarre enough to have a, a, a two beings like that walk into your house, right? I mean, it's got to be, so the cognitive dissonance that you're experiencing in the moment must be unbelievable if you can just put yourself there. But it wasn't just the appearance of these two guys. It was falling in place with a lot of other things. And then the job offer comes out of the blue, right? So... It's like behind the scenes, there were a lot of factors working, and she said they just seemed to feel like maybe if we leave Denton, we'll escape this crap. You know, now, the were... thing you mentioned here, the job offer, that sounds like something that could be manipulated by yeah. a government agency. But why? 
Yeah, I know. That's what it, it, there's only questions. Uh, you know, they're, they're really I, I don't have any answers. Uh, I just try to re- stick with what I found out and but, I don't have any answers. Going more in detail with these abduction scenarios. So once again, we're talking about what more reptilian kind of creatures. Well, no. Um, what kind of creatures? Let's be more specific about okay. the type of creatures and the interactions in terms of communication. All right. For, for, for Carla's family, uh, you know, you have to separate that experience from later she got involved with many people who came to her who were having the abduction experiences. And, uh, and we'll get into Barbara Bartholik, I think we should, a little while later. Because Barbara Bartholik was the uh, hypnotist that, that, that Carla depended on and Leah Haley depended on. And they would drive, you know, across states to go to, to Barbara or Barbara would come to them. Uh, now, what was her background? Was she just a hypnotist or a psychologist? What? Her background, uh, Barbara was, uh, you know, I'm in uh, mid-60s. Barbara was older than me. As a young young woman, I think she had uh, been an actress. Uh, then she married, kind of gave up acting, and moved to the Midwest. But she, too, had had, you know, she was a person with uh, many uh, psychic and, quote-unquote, uh, paranormal experiences in her background. Uh, and that led her in, uh, herself into her own investigation, eventually to hypnosis. And Barbara Bartholik, I, I knew her, and I, I got to know her through, and I met her both back at the conferences, and I met her once or twice, twice when she visited L.A. We stayed in touch, and when she was coming to town, I'd, I just met with her shortly, went and where she was staying and sat in the background, uh, backyard on a picnic table and talked to her. And uh, you could see that Barbara was very weighted by these things because, you know, when she did these hypnotic regressions on people, some of the things that came through were, were, were absolutely horrendous. I mean, just horrendous. Now, uh, you know there are criticisms made of such things as hypnotic regression. Yeah. One example is Kevin Randall. I mean, he was co-author of a whole book about abductions where they really attacked regressions as a very inaccurate way to recover suppressed or lost memories. Right, I agree. I agree. So that kind of puts the whole thing in the, in the gray area, you know, and that's where we are. And also, it depends on your bend, you know, and you try to fit this information into your worldview, your Weltanschauung, you know, where does it fit into your worldview? How do you fit it in there? You know, and I think that's a lot of, uh, we see, we, we try to find a place to, you know, slip this into our worldview, and it changes your worldview quite a bit. In the now, case is of, that part of the problem with UFO abductions? We're trying to fit it in, into our worldview of today. So we obviously have good reason to believe there are aliens in the universe, possibly intelligent races who will be visiting us. Certainly the more we learn about our universe, the more this is validated with Earth-like planets. And we can think that maybe there was life, intelligent life could have existed on Mars long ago, on the Dead Sea bottoms of Barsoom or so much and so forth. With this kind of society, when we're visited by anything or anyone, whether it's manipulated or not, we're going to believe it's E.T. because that's the way we're hardwired. Well, yeah, well, you see, the, 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 like Quetzalcoatl, you know, visiting, uh, uh, you know, in, in uh, Central America and, and comes and uh, a bearded white man comes out of the sky, lands, teaches them, stays with them for a period of time, and then leaves and says he shall return. And, of course, the next people to return that were white and bearded was Columbus and the boys, and they thought this was Quetzalcoatl returning. But he left by air. And many of these things leave by air. And so you go, okay, so they're coming from space. Well, they could just be coming from, you know, a few hundred miles away. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? It's like when you go to the airport and you see a plane land, you go, well, that's not necessarily from Jupiter. It's from New York. So the reason I bring this up is I keep wondering how much of what we're seeing is the remnants of an even older civilization that is still around and is somehow uh, – laying low in the background through this long epoch of time and doing certain things with an agenda that we haven't arrived at yet. Of course, that takes us to the legends of the Deros and Tiros from Richard Shaver, the theories of crypto-terrestrials from the late Mac Tonys. So much more to talk about with Richard Saradet, the quiet researcher. And we have, with Gene and Chris, the quiet... <laughs> See, Chris didn't pick up on that. <laughs> I was waiting for We have Gene and Chris. You're in the Shh, quiet. The Paracast. Hey. 
Hey, neighbors, you've seen all those crazy, wacky products on TV. The perfect tortilla, easy covers, hot booties, furniture fix, petty spin, and more. Where do you find all that stuff? You go to asseenontv.com because this is the one-stop source for all of these TV goods advertised. Find all your favorites as seen on TV. Check them out as seenontv.com. And by the way, save 10%. Here's what you do. Use the code SEEN1, S-E-E-N number one, SEEN1. Go to asseenontv.com to order. Save 10%. Purchase this summer's hottest As Seen on TV items. Save 10%. Or call 1-866-277-3366, 1-866-277-3366. The code Scene one to save 10%. Friends, this is Alex Jones for MidasResources.com. For more than 15 years, I have exclusively used Midas Resources for all my precious metal needs. Whether it's bullion or collectibles you're looking for, Midas Resources is simply the best. I own my gold as a hedge against inflation. This Federal Reserve fiat currency could go the way of the Deutschmark and the Weimar Republic any time. In these historically dangerous times, it makes sense to physically hold gold and silver. Midas already has some of the best deals in the industry. But if you give them a call and mention the radio special, they will give you a list of the day's super specials. Midas brokers are standing by to answer all your questions at 800-686-2237. They also have a lot of informative free literature explaining the opportunities and risk of holding precious metals. They are ready to answer your questions at 800-686-2237. Again, that's 800-686-2237. Hi, my name is Annette, and due to menopause symptoms for nearly two years, I suffered severe hot flashes, which prevented me from sleeping all night. It was so hard to work because I continued all day to have the hot flashes from hell. I was exhausted and depleted. After only three weeks on One World Way, I have no hot flashes, and I'm sleeping normally again. I feel energized and strong. This is an amazing product. It is a little-known fact that every single cell of your body is supposed to produce 10% of its protein content as glutathione. But due to toxicity and aging, it does not. Could glutathione be a missing factor in optimal cell function for your entire body? If you restore the optimal glutathione levels in your cells, especially your glands and organs, then as a result, your glands and organs work better. Imagine the quality of life improvement you might have. To order One World Way, call 888-988-3325. That's 888-988-3325. Or visit OneWorldWay.com. That's OneWorldWhey.com. What's safer and cheaper than prescription drugs? Glad you asked. The answer is Renovation Teas. Herbal remedies are much safer and much cheaper than prescription drugs. Taste great, and most importantly, herbal teas are effective and non-addictive. Renovation Tea is especially unique, and here's why. We spent years researching herbs and their beneficial properties. Renovation Teas uses only 100% organic, fair trade herbs. Our teas are blended towards specific ailments and health conditions, such as diabetes, blood pressure, anxiety, libido, detox, and much more. All renovation teas are formulated and hand-filled in Arkansas. Take care of yourself naturally, the way Mother Nature intended. Order renovation teas at renovationtea.com or call 870-784-3121. That's 870-784-3121. Renovation teas. Renovate your health one bag at a time. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Being shushed by Chris O'Brien. He does that all the time, by the way, in our personal interactions. (laughs) He's always been that way. A suppressive, as a Scientologist would say. He's a suppressive personality. <laughs> oh, don't even get involved in that. <laughs> now, before Chris joined us as co-host, in the previous incarnation of the PowerCast, we had someone on here who claimed to be in touch with the alleged nurse who had all this inside information about the Roswell case, which he threw away after he published the manuscript. He turned out to be a Scientologist, but he never went after us. So there you go. Oh, 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 oh okay. They love to shoot, don't they? 
Well, I'm waiting for Tom Cruise on the phone right now. I have a little red phone here when Tom Cruise is offended. He will call me. That's right. okay. Tom would be easier than John Travolta, I have a feeling. Hey, I just saw a headline in one of the tabloids as I was checking out of my supermarket that Tom Cruise is uh, going to take a big step back from Scientology. Of course, you never know if these things are true. but Well, I'm, I'm anxious to see how much of that step back Scientology permits him. Isn't it something there that you either have to get out completely or they're going to go after you forever or it doesn't matter? I don't know that much about Scientology, and that's not part of our discussion. We're talking about the alleged higher beings that Dr. Turner encountered about the people she dealt with. But we're talking here about this woman who did the hypnotic therapies or sessions. And as you tell me the way I understand it, she was a hypnotist. She was not somebody trained in psychology or psychiatry or a social yeah. worker or something. No. Right. So she came without that background, you know, again, as a uh, self-created explorer, you know, uh, like I said, I, she's a dear woman. I really, really, really admired her. And uh, and and this stuff weighed heavily upon her. Now, if you take that as her belt and shang, that the things that were coming out of these regressions, the things she was hearing and seeing. And when you're there and I've been to, through several uh, observations of regressions and when you see somebody relive it, sometimes. It is just startling how real it is. And yet other times, and I'm thinking of two cases in particular that I observed it, where even though the person was going through all this sort of emotional angst, I had a, a sense of confabulation and of acting that maybe even the person was not even totally aware of. So, uh, but being an actor and, you know, spending years, many, many years, uh, spend many evenings sitting in a professional acting class, you know, watching Actors go up and do scenes, then hearing the critiques, and you get to be a really acute observer, you know, of, of, of people, uh, because that's part of the craft of learning your craft as an actor. Just with that ear, that with that background, sometimes you'd hear that false note and go, mm-mm, mm-mm, something else is going on here, uh, you know. So uh, I, I agree totally, and, you know, having been out in the field uh, off and on for many years, interviewing hundreds, hundreds, and hundreds of people, you get that sense of when somebody has lost the reality of the situation and is starting to embellish or confabulate. Yeah, and it's almost seamless, but you can sure notice it if you're paying attention. But doesn't that also, if we have the imperfect nature of the regression process, that puts a cloud on some of the results that you got, right? Absolutely. I would agree, Gene. You know, it just leaves more questions than answers. One of the things I think that Carla felt and probably influenced by Barbara Bartholix, uh, being the hypnotist and the, the stories that came out of the people that even Carla directed to Barbara and was, you know, there for the sessions and the conversations afterwards, even in the case of Ted Rice. It's, this is very subtle and complicated stuff. I do believe that this is an interactive uh, conscious phenomena and that as soon as you enter it as an investigator, you are no longer uh, outside the glass looking in on your experiment, that somehow the glass is dissolved, and you are being manipulated as much as they are in this whole context. It's, it becomes very, very iffy. You know what I mean? So the investigator becomes part of what's being investigated. Yeah. And oh, then boy. you have a hard time separating yourself from the activities that are going on around you, and you, you lose your objectivity as an investigator because now it's playing with you. You know, it's funny here. John Keel used to talk about situations where he get a phone call, maybe from a phone booth, and pick it up, and it's for him. <laughs> And that goes back to all the stuff you see in movies like Bruce Willis would get that in a Die Hard film. And then there's this TV show called Person of Interest yeah. produced by Jonathan Nolan, who's the brother of Christopher Nolan and worked in writing the Batman series, the Dark Knight series. And there's a situation in a current episode where he picks up the phone. The computer's talking to him. Yeah. And he's looking up at the uh, camera, talking back to the computer, making it, cutting a deal with it. Right. I'm going to cut a deal with the computer. So you're going to help me find uh, my partner. Yeah. That's an interesting show. Uh, it's a good, a good base for good paranoia. You know? <laughs> yes, yeah, so you kind of wonder here where whatever force is involved is making the person who was investigating this an unwilling participant. But that goes back to the government disinformation thing. Because we see the government certainly has control of the phones. They obviously have ways to tap someone's conversation. So doesn't that lead you to think more and more that some of the stuff that Carla Turner and her friends were undergoing had some kind of government intervention factor? I did. I absolutely did. You know, uh, it's funny. They were a little bit, and so was John Mack, resistant to that. I remember going up to John Mack at, this, at that conference in Eureka Springs. That after we spent the night, the first night I spent at Carlos' house, the next day, 
Saturday morning, we drove up to uh, Eureka Springs uh, and uh, spent the, the day and the night at the conference and the next morning at the conference. Then we drove back. I spent some night at her house. Uh, both nights in her house were extremely strange for me because uh, there was definitely some something going on there. And if you want me to address that right now, I will, if, if that's going off the track. You want to stay with Barbara Bartholik and her, her belt and charm? What I'm trying to produce is this. There is, as soon as you begin to investigate this stuff, uh, the, the line gets very blurry because things begin to happen because you're there, maybe. You know, it's very, very, Chris, maybe you've experienced some of this with your investigation. You know, that suddenly you're, you're not the objective observer anymore. And well, I <laughs> believe me, that's like one of the things that I, I would like, you know, self-flagellate myself to be as objective and and totally grounded and impartial as possible. But yeah, you're right. I mean, there are, you know, uh, there were a few times when someone that I knew and respected and and really, really had a deep connection with and 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 understood their level of objectivity, they would tell me something so fantastic that I would almost be forced to buy into it. So, you know, it is, it is a, it's not a very well demarcated line between, between belief and, and disbelief. Yeah, Sometimes I, it is a, a, you know, there is a gray area there. So yeah, that's, that's a really good point, Richard. And I think, you know, what I've learned and, and, and constantly refining is, and discovering is how much, you know, the question we ask determine the answer we get. And, uh, you know, it's an evolution and, and sort of like, what is the basic basis nexus that has formed me, uh, you, your personality, your traits, the way you look at the world, your life experiences, and, and whatever it is, you know, the thing that forms you. And uh, when you when you get into this field and start to look for answers, you have to look at your own worldview and challenge that too. And it's sort of like a constant process of of, of like peeling an onion. Uh, you, you you kind of shed a layer of your belief system. You notice interfering with your you know your conclusions. And so you try to allow for that. Then you discover there's another belief system that you have that is also coloring what you're willing to look at and how you want to look at it. I don't know how to ex escape that, except that, you know, like you said, this uh, self-flagellation, you know, you discussed. Like you're trying to beat yourself this objectivity in a situation that's very hard to do because you're dealing with your own worldview. Your questions are coming from your own worldview. Richard Saradet is joining us with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter, and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that, too, in Graphic Converter. Also, print catalogs convert from so many formats i can't even list them download now to see if graphic converter is good for you like one and a half million other users guess what you could save money when you buy graphic converter use the coupon code night owl use the coupon code night owl to get a special price for graphic converter go to lemkesoft.com that's l-e-m-k-e soft.com lemkesoft.com l-e-m-k-e soft.com Every day, nearly 3,000 families enter into foreclosure and face losing their home. If you're currently behind on your mortgage, you can still avoid foreclosure. You can save your home, but you need to act now. We're Allied State Foreclosure Services. We're experts in saving homes from foreclosure. With just one phone call to us, you can stop the foreclosure process, lower your monthly mortgage payments, and save your home. Call now. The call is free with no obligation. 1-800-597-8843. Call us if you've been threatened with foreclosure, denied loan modification, or missed a payment on your mortgage. If you've been a victim of a predatory loan or are upside down on your mortgage, even if you've lost your job and you're worried about losing your home, don't wait. 
Call us now and let us help you save your home. You've worked hard to build a life with your family. Let us help you keep your home. Call now before it's too late. 1-800-597-8843. 1-800-597-8843. 1-800-597-8843. Iodine protection packs from HempUSA.org are now in stock for immediate delivery worldwide. Our iodine protection packs include micro plant powder, green life kelp, red palm oil, and our clear roll-on iodine that will feed the body the iodine it needs. All iodine protection packs are in stock. Save you money and ship for free in all 50 states. Visit HempUSA.org or call 908-691-2608 today. HempUSA.org has a revolutionary wonder food for detoxing the body and rebuilding the immune system. Micro plant powder can help unclog arteries and soften heart valves while removing heavy metals, virus, fungus, bacteria, and parasites. Plus, it cleans and purifies the blood, lungs, stomach, and colon. Keep your body clean with micro plant powder. Visit us at HempUSA.org or call 908-691-2608 today. Since 1974, Evelyn Gibson has helped thousands of people live healthier, happier, and more productive lives. Gibson'sHealth.com demonstrates, educates, and inspires customers to replace their healthy rows of lifestyles with a health-enhancing one. Now, clean up your body and colon without fasting using Herbal Fiber Blend from Gibson'sHealth.com. Most colon cleansers require you to fast and do colon irrigations, but Herbal Fiber Blend is the only body and colon cleanser that cleans without fasting. A plaque lined colon invites parasites and candida and we are overweight because we must eat twice as much to absorb good nutrients herbal fiber blend also cleans the kidneys and liver not just the colon no other cleanser on the market compares to herbal fiber blend to buy herbal fiber blend from gibson's health at wholesale prices call 800-388-6844 that's 800-388-6844 or go to gibsonshealth.com since 1974 over 30,000 healthier customers This is Kurt Seven, the author of UFO Mysteries, and you're listening to the Paracast. We have Richard Saradet, who's a not-so-quiet researcher on the Paracast with Gene and Chris. And we're looking at all these crazy events, the possibility of deliberate manipulation, how someone who researches the phenomenon suddenly becomes caught up in it. And I wonder there, is that also possibly self-generated? Because John Keel said... To run is an invitation to be chased. When, uh, when I was working uh, and, and trying to get behind what, what the whole COM-12 Mike Younger was, scenario was about, and I became very close to Mike Younger and spent many, 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 many days and hours and experiences with him. You know, you, you're, again, you're trying to get to the, uh, you know, like, whatever Mike Younger was, he, he wasn't quite what he presented himself to be at first, but he was still definitely had some kind of something behind him guiding him and feeding him information uh that i don't think anybody who spent any time with them whether it's greg or anybody else you couldn't help even don ecker has, has arrived at that place back then you know he was warning me so i'm telling you rich you better be careful you know these guys are disinformation you're going to get sucked in they're going to get hooked in and i said don that's what i expect you know i said i know I, I, I don't i don't want to turn us to magazine but i, I like with this stuff rising up right now, this whole abduction phenomenon, and you got this guy out talking like he's the next Navy SEAL and he's going to tell us all this kind of stuff. I said, well, this is the kind of stuff I'm interested in. I want to see if we can get the understanding of why they're playing these games. What's the payoff of them? What, what, what's this about? You know, And that was a long, slow process. Once again, the, the forming relationships and trying to get to know somebody well enough where you can tell when they're fabricating, when they're not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I watched Mike Younger's uh, uh, mental and emotional stability over the period of years I knew him, actually just dissolved into into extreme desperation and, and, and misery. And eventually, you know, he he dies of a heart attack uh, about 100 feet from the uh, bus stop down in uh, South Orange County. They find his body like he was walking along the railroad tracks, like he'd given up waiting for the bus or something, and they found him dead there. Um, and I have to admit, I, I feel very bad about the fact that I did not attend his funeral. Uh, I was just too, uh, whew, I can't say, it was all just too complicated for me at the time and, and extremely disturbing uh, to watch this go 
Pond and watched Mike attempt two suicides before that, uh, that we weren't, weren't sure were 100% real suicide attempts or whether they were just craving, you know, craving some kind of help and attention. Uh, I think he had. I think he had. A, he was a very artistic guy. If you see his artwork, he was incredibly artistic, a very, very deep and sensitive man in a lot of ways. Uh, had a very troubled childhood. Was you know, actually fits the profile of the kind of person you'd recruit to do something. Um, and I, he may have been recruited at some point by some entity. And uh, there's been hints, and I've had some very strong hints from some people I consider very reliable. That the Con 12 operation was an operation, uh, and it had its purpose. I'm still not clear on. It was first of all about getting certain information out because I think there's a big division in this government between uh, the viewpoint that certain elements take on this UFO phenomena, meaning the CIA and in, in its uh, venues, as opposed to uh, ONI, Office of Naval Intelligence, and the view they take. And I've had this uh, reinforced to me by three different sources over a long period of time that uh, and I can't I can't even talk about the sources so you can take a leap of what it's worth I'm not going to talk about the sources uh, but well well stop for one second why not because then I would lose them I, I, I'm sorry it's like and I, it's not that I, I give them 100% credibility I don't because you're dealing with people whose job it is to accomplish certain tasks and to take on anything that comes and deflect it or shape it or whatever you take that as a given but you know, you know, the acquired researcher people don't talk to you if they uh, and tell you anything useful if they know you're out there like just a I'm going to repeat it right away, you know. Also, you become a useful idiot because then you're just kind of farming out the crap you know that they're putting out. So you boy, up, do we see a lot of that, Richard? Yeah. <laughs> oh man. But this this big bag of gray files, you know, and a lot of it just sits there and just waits for something to ping. That might come along and go, oh, I remember him, but then you go look at it and see if there's anything else you can tie to it to get a clearer picture. The whole government involvement in this subject, uh, you know, in UFOs and abductions and all the intended phenomenon that are automatically knee-jerk connected to UFOs is, I mean, that's that's a huge subject right there. But But how about this little added element that not many people are willing to deal with? And this is a question from Nameless, who's been on, on our Paracast uh, forum, .theparacast.com, for about a year. And he wants to know if you've read Nick Redfern's uh, book, Final Events. And yeah. he supplies a quote from the website uh, touting the book. And it's, for decades, stories of alien abductions, UFO encounters, flying saucer sightings, and Area 51 have led millions of people to believe that extraterrestrials are secretly among us. But what if these millions of people are all wrong? What if the UFO phenomenon has much darker and far more ominous origins? For four years, UFO authority Nick Redfern has been investigating the strange and terrifying world of a secret group within the U.S. government known as the Collins Elite. The group well, believes that our purported alien visitors are, in reality, deceptive demons and fallen angels. They are minions of Satan who are reaping and enslaving our very souls and paving the way for Armageddon and Judgment Day. The question is, does anyone know what the deal is with the U.S. alphabet agencies interested in the occult, which totally puts a whole new ball of wax into the big ball of wax? Yeah. Well, there's several things I can add to that. First of all, talking about Nick Redburn's uh, coverage of the Collins Elite, uh, I went sniffing around about that, too, uh, uh, after reading it. And... Uh, you know, uh, what I've said before is just reinforced, is that there is a real split, a real conflict, and I mean it is real, uh, within the government on this issue, on the interpretation of the issue. And I'll show you some evidence for that. Going back to Mike Younger, they, you know, Mike Younger used to uh, sneer at the CIA, and, and, and they used to have a nickname for them, a derogatory nickname, Christians in Action, as you know, they say sarcastically. And, and what I've learned from other sources since then is that their view of the Collins elite, they think is full of crap. O and I does. But the CIA has embraced it. And uh, they've actually, you know, the, the, the conclusions of the Collins elite at the end of the book, if you read it, uh, there were some people uh, really pushing for a forcible conversion of Americans to Christianity uh, in, uh, as a kind of a precursor to the, the final events, as he names the book. And I think eschatology is a big, big, big 
like elephants sitting in the middle of the room inside the intelligence agency. The CIA got involved in, in this uh, occult a areas way back when, uh, as you know from clues you've seen from, from the books on uh, remote viewing. When you start giving a nice, fancy technical name like remote viewing, and, uh, you know, uh, they developed the uh, protocols, and it wasn't Ingo Swan, but the other guy uh, who helped develop these protocols. Ingo Swan did part of them, the protocols for remote viewing. You're still trying to concretize something which has been experienced by people, you know, for millions of years. I mean, you know, even your street corner psychic, you know, just a different way of, of, of a terminology to use. Um, this, when you enter into the dark and you're feeling around, trying to figure out what's in there, depending on where you're standing and what you're feeling, you can come to a different conclusion. And I think that's when we reach into the into this realm, this very soft realm of, of, of mental communication, you're dealing a lot with the, uh, the with the archetypes available in your own vocabulary of your mind, the images in your mind, the thoughts, your basic belief system. And uh, whatever information is coming through is going to take those pieces uh, to assemble something to present to you. Uh, that's kind of the way I view it. So uh, anytime you're, quote, unquote, getting information from an outside source or channeling or anything else, there's no way to, to validate it. Even if, the, if some of the things that are given to you actually happen, you'll see there's usually a, a series of things that happen and then a bigger one, and then you're already for the big one, and it doesn't happen. And we see this over and over again. Um, it's a very complicated area in which we are, we are really blind. It's like we're still feeling around in the dark. Gifted psychics, though, uh, really gifted psychics, which are, I think, more rare, uh, just see things uh, more totally and more clearly and are more grounded when they have the experience. It's, it's, more, it's more resolved with them. I'll uh, tell you what, we have a lot of resolve to explore with Richard Saradet. You're on with Gene and Chris. You're in The Paracast. <laughs> Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. Whether it's personal mail, whether it's business email, you want reliable, dependable delivery, freedom from spam, freedom from viruses. Well, Polaris Mail offers professional email hosting services for your personal or small business use. Each account uses 25 gigabytes of storage, an easy-to-use webmail interface, and full mobile sync. Sign up today for a 30-day free trial at PolarisMail.com, PolarisMail.com. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It just stopped responding. It took hours before it returned, but I'd already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Check it out. iWeb.com. That's iWeb.com. Let's keep preparedness simple. Do you need stuff for disasters? Of course you do. For over 15 years, DisasterStuff.com has, well, stuff for disasters. See? Easy to remember. DisasterStuff.com. Want free shipping on a new Berkey water filter? DisasterStuff.com is the official Berkey in-stock shipping center. Lots of folks want an EMP Faraday bag to protect sensitive electronics during a solar or nuclear event. Now for a limited time, all survival gear purchases over $75 include a free 8 by 8 inch EMP Faraday bag. Just enter promo code EMP bag when you check out at disasterstuff.com. We're also a country living grain mill authorized dealer. Plus, we offer freeze dried foods by Alpine Air and Wise Foods. We also carry emergency kits, survival seeds, and much more. Preparedness should be simple, and it is. Just remember disasterstuff.com. Freedom through self reliance and personal responsibility. Vote for radio. You know, right now, so many people are trying to get themselves elected. Not a day goes by I don't see a billboard or get a mailer or a flyer or receive a phone call from a politician of some sort. All politicians have something to say, so why don't they say it? That's right, say it here on the radio. 
That way, voters could hear the emotion in their voices and hear the passion they might have to serve the public as an elected official. You know what, politicians and campaign managers? Radio can do that for you. Here on GCN, the Genesis Communications Network, you can target voters with an affordable radio campaign that might help you get elected by using a medium where your competition may not be. Radio. And advertising on GCN is more affordable than you might think. Learn more. Visit GCNlive.com. Then shoot us an email. Advertise at GCNlive.com. That's advertise at GCNlive.com. Vote for radio. Here it comes. Another cold and flu season. Get ready for it and save now during the pre-winter sale at HerbalHealer.com. Don't be without powerful natural flu fighters like elderberry power capsules. They support the immune system and they have antiviral properties. Another powerful antiviral is olive leaf capsules, highly recommended by Herbal Healer Academy. Also on sale is Physician Strength Oregacillin, a savior for the lungs. It fights bacteria, virus, and fungus. Our famous four herb capsules are a gentle liver cleanser and can be taken daily. Also featured this winter are the homeopathic detoxes, liver, kidney, lung, lymph, whole body and brain detox on sale and remember as always new customers get a free 128 page catalog with your order log on and hit the pre-winter specials at herbalhealer.com healing the world with nature one person at a time since 1988 this is Jerome I'm Clark, author of the UFO Encyclopedia and other books. You're listening to the Paracast. The less than quiet researcher, how's that? Richard Saradet. But he's quiet when people give him information and say, protect my name, protect the source. You're with Gene and Chris on the Paracast. Chris, you want to pick up on another question, please? Yeah, I do. And this comes from the cake is... Ali, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> that's an interesting avatar name. They signed up yesterday, just in time for the show, Richard. And they say, first time poster here with a question. As someone who feels unconvinced about the validity of memories regained by hypnotherapy, I was wondering what you would say to someone like me to convince me. Oh, well. Also, what research has been done on the subject by the scientific community, mainstream or otherwise, and what are their findings? Now, obviously, we have gone over some of this territory, but we haven't really discussed the, um, I think, the disdain that the academic and scientific communities have in relation to hypnotic regression and, and abductions. Well, uh, uh, several things I want to say about that. First of all, uh, I'm not drawing any conclusions. And I would not try to persuade anybody of the validity of a hypnotically regained material because uh, I can't persuade myself. I just have to consider it. And uh, I think always the devil's in the details. You know, in our, in our waking life, we have, as we go through a day, we have moments of more clarity, less clarity. You know, we have emotional uprisings, lower uprisings. All of these things are going to color what comes out in a relaxed state, whether you go into meditation and the images start coming up or whether you go into meditation and images start coming up. I don't think you can trust any images on the face value that come up uh, in this area through hypnotic regression. They may be symbolic images to some extent. And so, uh, you know, I, I draw no conclusion. Uh, I would not try to convince you that you should rely on, on the information. As far as scientific uh, attempts to valid, uh, validate the reliability of hypnosis, it has been used, it depends on the subject. It's been used very successfully on some subjects with accurate information. Uh, I, you know, police departments have been very successful, and the FBI has been successful at using hypnosis sometimes to get more information uh, after an event than the person consciously recalls. Under hypnosis, you can clarify a moment. You can zero in on it. The subconscious is amazing. A car that drove by, you can go back and perhaps with a, uh, sufficient relaxation and direction, actually bring that image back up and see the license plate, the make and model and color of the car. And that has been successfully used by uh, law enforcement, but it's not a foolproof method. You know, it's not something you depend on anymore than you depend on remote viewing. We're just too, we're just too wet behind the ears to, to be able to uh, consider this a, a valid scientific tool. It's just another thing that you have to kind of pick and choose through. Like in real life, when you meet somebody, you have to pick and choose uh, how you take them, you know, how you respond to them. Now, uh, so uh, that, as far as validity goes, it's, it's questionable and it's up and down depending on the subject and the situation. 
But as, as being invalid, it's not totally invalid, nor is it totally valid. I still can't get back to feeling that with Dr. Turner, some of the experiences that she may have had in possibly the ones that she investigated involve some kind of deliberate manipulation by someone that wasn't something to be taken at face value. But let's go back, and I asked this before we got sidetracked with the way the evidence was gathered, and that is the creatures she saw during the course of these abductions. Can you describe them in more detail? Um, well, I'd I like to start with the husband's experience, his first recollection uh, sure. on the hypnosis, uh, when he describes uh, his encounters, what, what he described and, and termed the ancient one. And he describes the ancient one as looking somewhat like a a gray, but you know, wrinkled, wrinkled forehead, uh, old, 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 kind of dried up, tall and spindly, uh, with the with the large cranium and large eyes, uh, but not necessarily wraparound eyes. And his description of this, uh, this, his meetings with this was was that he realized that this was not a first meeting, that this he knew this being whatever, and that this being the ancient one never got happy about things or sad about things, just did the work, so to speak. You know, it's sort of like a, a, like a scientific task or doing an experiment. There, yet there was a sense of great purpose. Uh, and so that's the description he would give of the creature he saw repeatedly sometimes in his abduction, and that there was a history he had with this, this, this creature. Now, as far as uh, the other creatures... Uh, at times, they are in the bar, some of the uh, beings uh, described by abductees taken to Barbara Bartholic were the conventional grays. Others were uh, something else, something, uh, how would they describe, uh, reptilian, literally like a, 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 if you can picture a man that was a, a reptile and that there were these reptilian experiences and, and the description of these regressions. And, of course, you've got to remember the interaction between the subconscious of the hypnotist and the subconscious of the hypnotic subject. That's why it gets so tricky to interpret or, or put any real concrete you know, faith into, because how much of Barbara's uh, hypnoregressions were shaped by her spiritual worldview is hard to distinguish. But in the case of these regressions involving reptilians, the experience were usually extremely negative, extremely aggressive, and, uh, you know, uh, rapes, uh, you know, uh, threats, uh, all kinds of dark, dark, heavy manipulation, you know, like a like gangbanger kind of stuff, you know. That would be the experience some of these uh, abductees had with their abductors, and they were described as reptilian, where other people would describe a different set of experiences, much more neutral, yet all of involved shown scenarios to see their reaction, uh, people being manipulated into relationships, uh, almost reset up. All this material that comes out of the uh, her material, out of her book, you uh, uh, in The Masquerade of Angels, to go back to that book, because I think it's particularly significant and useful. The story of Ted Rice, I think, is uh, a good example of how we're peeling the onion. Because his interpretation of, of uh, experiences changed uh, the more he got into it. Uh, and eventually he came to a place where what he thought was a spiritual experience involving, you know, high beings evolved into a recognition that, wait a minute, this is not what it seems. And that's when he began to really go is this involving flying saucers and aliens? And he described several mass abductions taking place that he saw and observed and was a part of outside of Shreveport. Uh, there were multiple witness accounts. You know, his, his journey is a journey away from what he was comfortable with as a psychic to a much larger, more complicated scenario. And he, early in his, in his book, describes he gets a job one summer that he seemed to have been told he was going to get, and he didn't see how it was going to happen. And he ends up working out of Sun Valley uh, uh, for the summer uh, at, you know, among the, 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 you know, the billionaire row there uh, where everybody goes where their rich people go for their summers and have a great time up there. And I have a friend who lives right near there. And so he's working there that summer and he loves the mountains. He's from the south like me. It's like mountains. Cool. So he does a lot of hiking. And on these hikes, he runs into this, this woman he describes as very attractive. He sees her around the place, you know, here and there. Uh, she meets him, he'd go out to these long hikes, and sometimes she'd be there and waiting for him, so to speak, and they would sit and talk, and yet she's very cryptic. She tells very little about herself. She's very gentle uh, about uh, questioning him about, about who he is and what he feels, almost like she's uh, mentoring him in a certain way. 
And at one point, they're sitting and looking at the, the sky late in the day and the distance of the mountains and a, you know, a valley. And she says something about, do you believe in UFOs? As a matter of fact, and he goes, well, <laughs> you know, I don't know. And then in the distance, a UFO comes off behind a mountain, peeks out, and goes behind it. She, uh, in their last meeting, says something like, well, I've got to go back to my people. Because he's getting more curious about who she is, and she's very evasive. He keeps asking questions about this woman around a resort. Like, did you see this lady? And nobody has ever seen the lady he keeps meeting out there. And she's uh, kind of uh, olive-skinned, very attractive. And she says her and her people live high up in the mountains. And that's about as close as he ever got to it. Again, it, there, I, this picture that forms is so complicated. One is inclined, I am inclined to think that, you know, we live in a great chain of being. And that where we think, you know, we are the top of the ladder here in this environment, uh, we may not necessarily be. And these other beings or these other people, they maybe have always been here. They may be from somewhere else. Who knows? But these influences paint a complicated picture, which seems to say that something is engineering us in a particular direction. And yet, as a group movement, kind of move the whole society in a direction. And yet, it's individualized also. Your personal path, your personal uh, change you go through is also being uh, managed and mentored. It's, I know it's a big picture to consider. That's my take, uh, one of the things I consider going on. Wow. Does that make any sense? Yes, as a matter of fact. Chris has a question in the waiting, but we'll get to our next segment before we do it. You kind of look here as to whether it is all about the journey and not so much ever finding out a solution to the UFO mystery or whatever that morphs into 10, 20, 30, 50, or 100 years from now. We never understand. We have Richard Saradet. He's the quiet researcher who's not so quiet when he gets going. We've been focusing very heavily on the work and experiences of Dr. Carla Turner and the people with whom she came in contact. But you're with Gene and Chris. We're not so quiet. You're in the Paracast. The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. GCN. Great talk radio starts here. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you'd like to listen to GCN programs on the go, I have great news. GCN has created a Droid and iPhone application, and it's free. Just as easy as going to GCNlive.com, click on the banner, and download. Before you know it, you'll be listening to your favorite hard-hitting GCN shows, live or on demand, right on your Droid or iPhone, 24-7 and on the go. So download the Droid and iPhone app free by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Thanks again for listening to GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. How would you like to have normal blood pressure? This is Ernesto from Illinois. I had my doctor's appointment yesterday and I got my labs in. My HDL is 119L and my LDL is 37L. My doctor asked what I was doing to lower it so much, so I told her about HB extract. Millions of people like Ernesto are suffering from high blood pressure, congestive heart failure, unbalanced cholesterol, irregular heartbeat, and clogged arteries. But now there's an effective, natural, 100% organic nutritional supplement for a healthy heart and circulation. Heart and body extract. My blood pressure has not gone past 125 over 80 in almost a month. Experience amazing benefits when your body gets what it needs with the assistance of heart and body extract. She did a double take when she looked at my ER labs. She couldn't believe it. Order at HBExtract.com or call 866-295-5305. That's HBExtract.com or call 866-295-5305. Thank you. Heart and Body Extract. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. Yes, that shadowy voice 
belonging to Chris O'Brien, because something happened to his voice. Strange creatures have taken him over. It is the trickster. I was trying to be quiet and then uh, not so quiet at the same time. Sorry about that. It didn't quite work. Anyway, I have a question from one of our longest time posters at forum.theparacast.com. His name is Ward. Very Happy insightful. Birthday, Ward. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it's Ward's birthday. Very well, insightful a few guy. Days ago, anyway. uh, I know he's he's a, a big fan of of Don's uh, show and uh, is a big fan of yours. And uh, he has several questions here, but because we were talking about descriptions of modern humanoids, he wants to know. We have the standard greys, tall and short, Nordics, reptilians, and praying mantis figures. However, why do we not hear of spider humanoids, banana people, and amoeba creatures? If close encounters of the third kind are merely inventions of the mind, would not these inventions be as varied as imagination could make them? Excellent question. A tough question, for which I don't think we have an answer. Uh, I think... Uh, the idea of a banana person would be a, 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 a real cognitive dissonance. <laughs> but then you, again, you've got Moses talking to a burning bush. You know, it's like if there is an intelligence that operates independently of our physicality but can, uh, you know, intrude upon us either through the use of our frontal lobe or by physically manifesting something in front of us or somehow what is that link? Because, you know, what comes into your eyeball has to be processed before it's interpreted by the brain as being a specific thing. You know, the optic nerve has to transport the data from the eyeball, and then it has to be translated into something that you uh, is recognizable. That little stretch right there between those two things allows for a vast amount of uh, error. <laughs> uh, I, I, th- I do think that my experience with, uh, with psychotropic drugs, again, reinforces that. What you're looking at is you looking at something. You know, the observer is the thing observed to a large extent. So uh, if there is an outside entity which has a purpose, which includes, uh, you know, inducing a cognitive dissonance, maybe it takes a form that is very um, serendipitous or ridiculous. And maybe it is going to be a talking banana. You know, so it, it's hard to know. Is this just a manifestation of your own mind? These are things we are, we are, we are struggling forward. Dr. Kenneth Ring, however, uh, uh, you know, are you familiar with him, either one of you? Kenneth J. Ring? Uh, yes, and, uh, and Ralph Ring. Yes, and you know the results of their research, their study, uh, they found a correlation, be- uh, a higher correlation of incidences of abduction reports from people who had traumatic or uh, abusive experiences when they were young. And uh, I think he tended to interpret that in a way that I also kind of interpret a little bit from my own experience, and that is you can be more vulnerable at times to these kinds of intrusions depending on where you are personally than at other times. And people who have had, like, who have died and come back to life on the, on the operating table. Uh, I know several of my friends who went through Vietnam who had these kind of experiences, the, the tunnel of light, and then thinking they're free and feeling wonderful and free, and then also, no, you're not done yet. And zoop, they're right back, and they're, you know, back in the medevac with their chest being sewn up and my pumping blood into them, that kind of stuff. The, uh, but uh, people who have had uh, uh, traumatic experiences uh, with illness, people who have had uh, sexual abuse or physical abuse, this, this reduction in the sense of a person's safety and, 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 and uh, inviolability that is broken, that trust, that safeness is broken at a very early age, they seem to be more susceptible, according to Dr. Ring, to the abduction experience. Are you familiar with that argument? Yeah, absolutely. In, in fact, traumatic experience um, can really adversely impact a person all throughout their life. Yeah. And, and this, this brings up another really interesting question that Ward has. And he says, in your opinion, Richard, how much of a role do you think we as the observer play in the UFO paranormal phenomenon? Are we co-creators in witnessing, creating the activity, or are we simply observers to it? I think that's a very tricky question because if something can, can use your own mental faculties, uh, like remotely, like you can take over control of a computer, uh, you know, who's to say how much of it is your interpretation, how much of it is being projected into you? It's very, very, it gets to be very iffy. We can only interpret things according to our ability to interpret them, you know, like a dream. A uh, dream have very odd images, but sometimes if you break down the images, and if you studied uh, uh, read in the work of Carl Jung, you'll see how rich an area this is for understanding oneself, that there is an active part of our being which almost 
acts outside of ourselves on ourselves to put us in certain situations, I think. So it's very complicated and subtle. I agree. It's a uh, it's a hall of mirrors with a quicksand floor, I think, as uh, Linda Moulton Howe put it at one point. But, Chris, don't you think because the floor keeps moving that we have to keep moving? And that may be the point. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I've, I caution, you know, people that, uh, people that attend conferences and I'm sitting up at the podium. The first thing I say is I'm not an expert. I don't claim to be one. People call me that but don't believe them. And anybody that does come up here and say they are an expert, uh, don't believe them and run away. So, I mean, all we have is more is people that ask more creative questions. Obviously, we really haven't gained much uh, further under- understanding. We haven't really pushed the ball down the field in the last 60 years. I mean, there's no irrefutable proof that we're being visited by extraterrestrials. All this is all anecdotal. It's totally uh, subjective. We don't have an answer. And so I think, Richard, you, you will agree, and I, I'm sure Gene does, that we need people with more creative questions. The Jacques Vallées, the Keels, uh, people like Terrence McKenna and others who you know, are trying to look at this thing outside of the box and not only figure out the new questions and the creative approaches that we need to take, but why the the approaches that we've you know for decades have been trying aren't working. So there's there's a major disconnect between spinning your wheels and pushing the ball down the field. And I think you'd agree with that. I would too. I absolutely agree with you. And I, and I think that is the challenge that we all work so hard at. Is once we recognize this, uh, we always want to make the disclaimer like uh, I'm no expert. I don't know anything because the more you know, the more you realize, man, you don't know. <laughs> but I think uh, we have the, the ball. I think we have moved the ball to that extent that we've come to the realization that we got to look deeper. This ain't it. Yeah, I, I, I love it when people introduce me to uh, a stranger and they say, hey, this is the uh, guy that believes in aliens. And I, oh, you know, God. my immediate response is, wait a minute. Yeah, How do we know we're not the aliens and what we think is alien is more terrestrial than we are? <laughs> I tell you, that's a hard one. I get that, of course, because uh, I've got parents and students and all kind of stuff. And the assumptions, the built in assumptions they make. You know, it's interesting. I have a cousin. He's a retired university professor. And I've met him maybe two or three times in my life, partly because I live far and away from where he lived. Okay, I later learned in getting back in touch with this branch of the family that he didn't like me. Why? Because I was interested in UFOs and he didn't believe in aliens. So therefore, <laughs> I was a bad guy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have a, a student whose mom is uh, a NASA scientist working on the. Uh, on the Titan uh, project, the Moon Titan project, you know, sure. and uh, you know, and she's, uh, you know, she's just one of the scientists with her particular specialty working on it. And uh, they come into my class as sophomores, and they've already heard the stories about, you know, are you going to be a bridge? And of course, I'm considered anything but the quiet researcher at school. I'm a very uh, uh, lively, energetic character, as you might get from this interview. Uh, I'm mean, anything but quiet. In fact, Greg might have been sarcastic and saying that. <laughs> I don't know. So but what still, is going to happen now is Greg Bishop is listening to this episode. He says, you know, I'm going to call Richard the loudmouth researcher. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't, you know, it's his name for me. I've got to accept either one. <laughs> I'm sure it's done in the spirit of friendship because you're yeah. really a nice guy. Uh, and he's a terrific guy and a great researcher and always challenging me to think deeper and think broader. Uh, Greg is really great at that. We always enjoy having Greg on the show because he always gets a new insight. You know, you think about something that hasn't come to your mind, and that's what we need in the UFO field more and more is out-of-the-box thinking because the conventional wisdom has taken us nowhere. The conventional wisdom is everything you could learn from the first book that Major Donald Kehoe wrote about UFOs back in 1950. That's the conventional wisdom. That's old-fashioned. Richard Saradet is not old-fashioned. In spite of my age. (laughs) You're with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. Hey, neighbors, you've seen all those crazy, wacky products on TV. The perfect tortilla, easy covers, hot booties, furniture fix, petty spin, and more. 
Where do you find all that stuff? You go to asseenontv.com because this is the one-stop source for all of these TV goods advertised. Find all your favorites as seen on TV. Check them out as seenontv.com. And by the way, save 10%. Here's what you do. Use the code SCENE1, S-E-E-N number one, SCENE1. Go to asseenontv.com to order. Save 10%. Purchase this summer's hottest As Seen on TV items. Save 10%. Or call 1-866-277-3366, one 866 The code Scene 1 to save 10%. Have you ever felt like the United States government knows way too much about your financial affairs? I continue to hear stories about property seizures, frozen bank accounts, confiscation of stocks and bonds. It makes me wonder if the U.S. citizen will ever again have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Unfortunately, with the Drug and Money Laundering Act, the IRS Revenue Ruling 6045 of 1984, and the Trading with the Enemy Act and Franklin D. Roosevelt's Executive Order of 1933, some precious metal holdings are subject to government intervention. For this reason, Midas Resources has prepared a report explaining the boundaries of trading precious metals privately. Whether if you have any intention of trading with Midas Resources or not, I have instructed my representatives to give this report out free. Call for your free copy at 1-800-686-2237. When investing, always proceed with caution. Again, call 1-800-686-2237. Exercise your legal right to trade metals privately. 1-800-686-2237. We all know that Berkey Water Purification Systems are the most trusted name in water filtration. As an authorized Berkey dealer for over six years and serving thousands of satisfied customers, the Berkey Guy offers amazing specials for Berkey water filtration systems. The Berkey Light Systems include a set of self-sterilizing and recleanable black purification elements that purify water by removing chlorine, pathogenic bacteria, cysts and parasites to non-detectable levels and remove harmful chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides. Order the Berkey Light System today complete with two black Berkey elements for only $231 and the Berkey Guy will ship your order free of charge. With the purchase of a Berkey Light, the Berkey Guy is also offering a set of fluoride and arsenic filters for only $39.99. That's over 30% off the retail price. Call the Berkey Guy at 1-877-886-3653. That's 1-877-886-3653. Or order online at GoBerkey.com. That's GoBerkey.com today. Healthy soils grow healthy plants. So before you plant your survival garden this year, is your soil healthy? Maximize your crisis garden soil with EM1 from Terraganics. EM1 organic soil conditioner, fertilizer amendment, and compost accelerant provides healthier gardens and faster, efficient garden composting. EM1 from Terraganics.com quickly improves soil structure by increasing nutrient availability and converting organic matter into soil humus. This improves seed germination and root growth, improves plant quality, size, color, flavor, nutrient value of fruits and vegetables and improves shelf life. And when rain is not in the forecast, no worries. EM1 improves moisture retention in soils, helping reduce drought stress. Just like you prepare all else, prepare your crisis garden for maximum yields with EM1 from Terraganics.com. Order now at T-E-R-A-G-A-N-I-X.com or call toll-free 866-369-3678. That's 866-369-3678. Terraganics, life's getting better. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Chris is not old-fashioned either. He's the youngin amongst our little group. We have Richard Saradet joining us. Chris, any more questions in our forms? We didn't give much time for the questions to be asked. Yeah, I do, and I have another one from Ward, Richard. You know, we did talk about uh, Mike Younger a little bit, but Ward has a, a question that kind of drills down a little bit on this. Could you describe your own personal experience with meeting Bob Lazar of Area 51 fame and your impressions of him and his story? That's part one. And also, and this is, this is a bit of a twist that I wasn't aware of, also, could you describe who alerted you to a possible Yakuza connection with Bob Lazar? 
And I think that comes from the enigmatic character known as Mike Younger and the strangeness surrounding him and his information. But why don't you address Lazar first, uh, in you know, briefly, and then talk about a Yakuza connection. That's that's one on me. Right. Well, I met Bob Lazar when Don and I went up to interview him, and I, I played the role of the uh, cameraman. Uh, I had the camera, so I, my my reason for being there was to record the conversation. And I, again, that was my way of of, of, of being quote unquote invisible. You know, uh, not really being there to do the research. But, the quiet you know, researcher. Yeah, and just kind of be there and listen like a fly on the wall. Now, this ties right into what War was saying. Uh, we discussed this briefly uh, recently on, on uh, Don's show. Younger had said, when, when uh, I told him Don and I were to go up there and, and go interview Bob Lazar, he said, hey, when you're in Lazar's house, make sure you make a trip to the bathroom. And in the ante room to the bathroom, there's pictures on the wall. And uh, look at that picture. There's a picture of Lazar standing with some other people. And uh, he said, you will see that they are uh, Japanese. And if you look carefully, you'll see, uh, you can actually see, you know, the Yakuza wear a mark on their wrist. You know that? They have a tattoo. Yakuza too. He said, you'll see that tattoo. So, sure enough. Uh, he also missing uh, the last digit of their little finger on the right hand or something? Uh, not all of them. That Only if they've been bad. Something like that. But Ooh, it was very... Boy, it sounds know, like the TV show 24 where they torture people. Well, the, you know, there's all this ritual when you join gangs, you know. It's sort of like, you know, building on that tribal mentality of blood commitment. Regarding the uh, uh, Yakuza presence at Bob's house, this brought into a big issue uh, that Younger was presenting to the uh, people he was talking to, including me. And uh, his, his, his warnings on Lazar was, this is not what it seems to be at all. You know, this is not what it seems to be at all. And that uh, there was a lot of concern uh, at, at security levels in the government of uh, uh, who was who was trying to espionage, uh, you know, our stuff at Area 51. And that this project may have been more about outing, uh, hopefully, some of these agents. And that this whole thing was a, uh, uh, a, a dramatic exercise to bring out for catching or getting a handle on foreign espionage agents and intrigue. But there's never one agenda in an operation. Usually there are agendas folded within agendas, so that one operation can accomplish several tasks at once. And I think the Lazar scenario might be a good example of that. So, so you're uh, saying that the, 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 the outing of Bob Lazar and, and George Knapp's original contact of him and, and the original um, outpouring of information may have been some sort of disinformation or counter-espionage uh, program? Yeah, I think that's a, uh, that's that's what at least what uh, Younger was indicating, and then uh, we I begin to try to look at it through those lenses. Uh, that was definitely a direction he was he was pushing us to look at the time. Like, don't take it at face value. And uh, uh, you know, the, the fact that he could describe the interior and the layout of Lazar's house and where I should go to see this photograph really raised some eyebrows. Because if he was in that house, it it wasn't with Younger's uh, with uh you know at some point it wasn't with Lazar's permission. <laughs> So I thought that was quite intriguing. Whether he personally saw it or whether it was given to him, I don't know. But I got, just by having gone up to that area with Mike Younger three different times, his knowledge of the area was extremely detailed. So uh, whatever it was, he, he seemed to, to, to be able to know where to go, what to do, and what to avoid. Now, uh, looking at Bob Lazar, that's such a big question mark there. We have, for example, the fact that he claims educational credentials that appear to have disappeared, all that stuff. Do you really think, for example, if his background was genuine, that the military has the power to go to all these educational institutions, take a whole person's life history, and wipe it out? Well, I, I don't know if you say the military does, but yeah, oh yeah, I think that. I think yeah, that's, absolutely. That's not the Gene. first time I mean, that's, that's been done. The last time. That's a no-brainer. Well, I'd like to wipe out a few things about my background, but that's a different story. I'd like to help. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for your support. Let's get started. I think everybody has something they did in their lives. I want to wipe that out. You know, so with, with Bob, it's hard to know. My impression, uh, to answer Ward's question uh, uh, of Lazar himself when I was there, I was quite intrigued to meet him, of course, because I'd, I remember I'd seen the, uh, uh, his first appearance on uh, UFO cover-up live when he was in shadow, and then later when it all just kind of blew up, you know. So I was quite intrigued at this opportunity. We met with uh, Gene Huff. We met Gene Huff first at Gene's house, and then we drove together over to uh, Bob's uh, house. And uh, pulling it up to Bob's house, you, you, first of all, you're struck by the fact that in his driveway, under the carport, sits a jet engine mounted on a car. 
The rocket car, right. The rocket car. I mean, this gigantic thing, right? And then go inside the house. It's just a typical little Las Vegas neighborhood house. Very, very tidy. Uh, almost like a, a, a model, like a model house, you know? <laughs> Everything in its place. And there was the room where he hung out, where his computers were, and he, it was like a divided living room, and it, he had desks sticking out, so he sat in this area behind the desk looking out in the living room. Computers to the right, right angle, another desk, computers to the left. And then down down the hall, if you went towards the bathroom, if you turn left, you went into what was his, I guess, working area, because in the middle of the room stood this uh, old six, seven feet tall uh, Tesla coil, you know, generator that, that sends out the sparks, you know, that thing, the big blast generator. You know what I'm talking about, right? If I got the right terminology for that. Yeah, like a Van de Graaff generator? Van de Graaff, yeah, thank you very much. That's it. So there's this big... Bright, shiny new Van de Graaff generator. It's now, for the listeners room. who wonder about that, isn't that the one that would make the hair stand on your head? Yeah, and make your hair yeah, stand and, and, and you know, uh, Tesla would used to demonstrate this ability with the sparks all flying around. He could go out and stand. Right, it's a great, it. it's a great stage prop. A great, yeah. it makes for great theater. Yeah, so a friend again, of mine built just, one when I was a teenager. Did you really? A friend yeah, of mine so, did. Yeah, so did my, my my brother's friend John Huey. We used to play with it in his in his basement. It was pretty cool. That's right. Uh, as but, long as the hair lasts, it's a lot of fun. Then basically uh, uh, what stands uh, 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 up then is the fuzz. Then it does the fuzz. Unless you're Nick Redfern. Oh, yes. yeah. Well, he's safe, you know. Well, well then it just causes a blue glow around the head. <laughs> yes, and he, he basically levitates about three feet, but that's a yeah, story. Yeah, but, but anyway, the, the, the feeling was in that room, which is both like where he worked, there were like counters along the wall. There was a few computer things there, a few little things there, but it, it looked more like a... A set than it was an actual working space. It didn't have like the, the untidiness and the stuff you would see if I was really doing research in there. It looked more yeah, like you should see my up. desk. Yeah, I mean, it looked like it was set up to be a set, like they were going to shoot a show here. So that always struck me as weird. And as far as him personally, he's very forthright, he's very direct. Uh, yet there's a, I don't know, there's something terribly disconnected in him to me. It is a, it, it, as an actor looking at another human being, it's like, there's something blank in there. Okay, does it look like, I'm going to ask you this question, but we'll hold the answer to the next segment. Does it look like it's all an act? He's putting on this persona for the benefit of whatever. We have Richard Saranet joining us with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are... The GCN Radio Network. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter, and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that, too, in Graphic Converter. Also, print catalogs convert from so many formats i can't even list them download now to see if graphic converter is good for you like one and a half million other users guess what you could save money when you buy graphic converter use the coupon code night owl use the coupon code night owl to get a special price for graphic converter go to lemkesoft.com that's l-e-m-k-e soft.com lemkesoft.com l-e-m-k-e soft.com you store guns, ammo, and food and water. But do you store peace of mind when it comes to your firearms? Now you can with Duracoat. The last thing anyone needs is a firearm that won't work when you need it most. Improve the factory finish and Duracoat your firearms once for a lifetime of protection against rust and corrosion. And Duracoat also protects against water, salt water, mud, grime, or whatever nature throws at you. The Duracoat Shake and Spray Finishing Kit has everything you need to finish a complete firearm for just $34.95. No need for an airbrush or other spray equipment. Just degrease, then spray on Duracoat and let dry for a lifetime of protection. Duracoat is the simplest and most user-friendly firearm finish you can buy. Use Duracoat on knives, camping equipment, or anything metal, plastic, or wood you want to protect from the elements. Call 800-830-6677 or visit Duracoat.net. Spelled D-U-R-A-C-O-A-T.net. Duracoat, the finest firearm finish on the planet. 
If you owe the IRS back taxes, listen carefully. Sweeping changes to IRS policies will help more people than ever eliminate their tax debts once and for all. And now, thanks to Dan Pillow, you can get the tax help you need to end your tax nightmare. Hi, I'm Dan Pilla. I've helped thousands of people reduce or eliminate tax debts they couldn't pay. And after more than 30 years of experience dealing with the IRS, I can tell you there's no such thing as a hopeless tax case. With the IRS's new policies, it's easier than ever to put your tax debt behind you once and for all. Call now at 800-346-6829 to learn how I can help you. You know your IRS debt will not go away by itself, but you don't have to live in fear anymore. Call 800-346-6829. Learn how I can help you eliminate wage and bank levies, release tax liens, and negotiate a settlement with the IRS that will put your tax nightmare behind you forever. Call 800-34-NO-TAX. Or go to my website, TaxHelpOnline.com. That's TaxHelpOnline.com. The worst drought in 50 years continues, and the first six months of 2012 marks the hottest half year on record. 78% of the Midwest Corn Belt is in drought conditions. Not only corn, but soy, alfalfa, fruits, vegetables, and wheat are all impacted, raising prices. The cost to feed livestock is forcing farmers and ranchers out of business, blowing up your food prices. The only strategy to counter this is to freeze your food cost at today's prices by getting your own supply of foods from eFoods Direct now. As the price of raw ingredients increases, eFoods will have to raise prices too. Now is the time to get your supply. I recently increased my supply from eFoods Direct because we have all known this was coming. You know about their delicious long-term storable foods. The fact is you can eat at any time to save money today. And because it stores for 25 years, you're locking in today's prices and avoiding the rising food cost. Don't wait. Call 800-409-5633 or go to eFoodsDirect.com forward slash Alex. Call 800-409-5633 or eFoodsDirect.com forward slash Alex. You can bet your life on eFoods Direct. Hi, this is nuclear physicist lecturer Stanton Friedman. You are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. So we're talking about Bob Lazar, very controversial figure in UFO research. We have Richard Saradet, the quiet researcher, joining Gene and Chris. So, okay, play acting or what? Hard call. Uh, I, uh, I think I think there is definitely an element of play acting in there, just as a, an actor myself. But an act, a play acting that's been embraced so that it isn't even play acting to him anymore. On the other hand, that curious little area I'd call a blank spot makes me wonder if there isn't some degree of programming in there that he's been fucked with. You know, like maybe, I don't know, but that he's an odd personality. Uh, he, you know, do you get that from just seeing him that this, this, he's an unusual personality? Well, is it a matter of being cold or what? Or disinterested? Yeah, yeah. Well, not disinterested. He seems to to pat. It's it's yeah, almost it's, like he he anticipates. He has all his his answers uh, lined up and dialed in. Yeah. It's all rehearsed. Like you can't get past that. Like when I was there, I was. Can we get past that? And no, no. He, he kind of controls it and it stays right there. So when I left there, I, I felt like very very suspicious of Lazar. Extremely suspicious. Now, you tell us you're suspicious of Lazar, but I think we have a lot of listeners who've heard Lazar mention our show from time to time. And maybe we need that 30 seconds or a minute backup to explain what this character is. For me? Yeah, go ahead and kind of tell our listeners again, remind them what this guy is doing and claiming, and then we can get back to the reaction. Oh, okay, all right, all right. So Lazar was the guy who was outed on the uh, on, uh, first time we see him in the public, as, as far as I know, is on UFO Cover Up Live. When he's presented in shadow as Dennis and talks about being hired uh, to work at Area 51 by Ed Teller to uh, work on back engineering the propulsion system of, a, of a, a flying saucer. And he said he describes his first visit out there and being taken there and uh, walking into the buildings and walking down the hallway and through a window. And he describes he actually sees the window briefly what he describes as a gray like in a white smock, talking to another scientist in the room. Now, that could have been staged for him or whatever. He then describes working on the saucer that he was uh, brought there to work on, and describes the saucer as the one you see uh, put out by Tester, the uh, S-4 saucer, which they built on the basis of Lazar's description, uh, and other people's description, not just Lazar's, which is uh, Andrew's emphasized that, but that the seats, there were seats in there, they were small, childlike, 
that there were three uh, gravity wave generators uh, put in a triangular format inside the ship, that there was a two level. The lower level was where that gear was. The upper level was where the they uh, operated from. And that this thing had no seams in it whatsoever. It all seemed to be cast from one piece. He also describes at one time being brought out there at night and actually uh, seeing a, uh, a demonstration of these craft. And he describes looking out of the hangar into the night there in front of the hangars, and there was a swarm of these discs kind of uh, rocking and rolling and moving about. He describes that like not one, but a swarm, like uh, three or four or five, I don't know. And they were all out there moving around like that. So uh, that's pretty bizarre. And also, Richard, Richard, uh, we, uh, let me digress for a second. He yeah. also took some very famous and notable uh, researcher, investigator, author types out there and predicted that they would see something. I think it was on a Wednesday night, uh, if memory yeah, yeah, serves exactly. correct. That's he also it, yeah. claimed that he was working with uh, some new uh, undiscovered element called uh, Element 115, which uh, now has been actually discovered and classified, which is nothing like he, he described. But he also claimed that he was uh, potentially drugged and uh, that there was some sort of uh, uh, memory and behavior modification that was done on him at certain times. And I, I digress further by saying the person who turned him on to all this, Ed Teller, was the father of the hydrogen bomb, who he claims he met at Los Alamos, where he claimed he worked. He, he was found in the phone book there. George Knapp and others have, have at least demonstrated that he was there, but there's no record of his uh, involvement at the lab there and also no record of his uh, claimed credentials at MIT. Well, if this was a disinformation operation, that was run by one little group within the government. Even the group he was working for may not have had knowledge of it. That's the way that tends to go. Uh, there is, I've seen a, a videotape of, of, of somebody going in to talk to Teller, and they had a, a, a video camera, I think, hidden in a briefcase. And, and I'm not sure it was Knapp, but maybe you guys can remember this. And Teller was being asked about, uh, about this subject, and uh, he doesn't know he's on camera. He says, if you're going to ask me about, you know, Bob Lazar, I won't talk. I won't talk. I won't talk about that, you know. Uh, <laughs> maybe he was, he was very... being polite to the guy and he created a monster right yeah you know he was very animated about it have you ever seen that clip so tell yeah, him I mean, was... i've seen seen reference to it too also in books but, but tell uh... him was like oh my guy how did how did my name get connected with this nut or i'm not going there don't even think about going there in this conversation it could be for other reasons who knows you know there's nothing conclusive about that depends what you want to read into it but the fact that, you know, he had been out to uh, uh, Lano, Los Alamos National Lab, that uh, they did find him in the phone book, that uh, Knapp has gone there with him, and uh, people waved at him and said hello to him, and he was uh, able to go quite deep into the facility, validates that he had some kind of position there at some point. And uh, they might have decided to use him just after that, you know, <laughs> who knows? You never know what psychological profile is going to like, you know, come up and, and be red flagged for a perfect disinformation agent. And, and oftentimes, the best disinformation agents don't even realize that's what they're being used for. Exactly. In fact, that's what you call a success. Uh, you know, and that's one of the things that Don was warning me about. Like, watch it. You know, they'll turn you into an asset. You won't even know it. And, uh, you know, those were very prophetic words. I mean, I, 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 I carried that, you know, very close to my chest every time I met with these people. I wish I was an asset because then maybe I could, like, call them on it and they could arrive uh, secretly one night with a Samsonite filled with uh, unmarked $100 bills or something. Well, there is that, of course. <laughs> Good but luck it, with that. Let me know if that works. Yeah, you? you're right. Yeah. I'll print up a card. <laughs> but you also have to wonder here, when people like Lazar do this, is he just a doofus who is being – manipulated every step of the way to do what he's doing? I don't know. I, I wonder if he's not unlike a lot of us find ourselves. Something's using us. <laughs> Something's Our using wives us. and girlfriends. Well, yeah. I mean, but that's the obvious, though, you know. Um, yeah. I wonder if we'll ever get to a bottom on the Bob Lazar case. I, I have, you know, another theory that uh, part of the purpose of that very, very uh, pseudo-scientific description of how the saucer worked wasn't uh, directly put out there to mislead uh, espionage teams from other countries. Uh, how successful that was, I don't know. But this discussion of the Yakuza being present with Bob Lazar and the fact that the Nippon Television had contacted Norio Hayakawa and asked him to take them out to Area 51 
because they were fascinated with this UFO story. And they went out there and they, they took the team out there several times. And I was out there once or twice, just coincidentally, when they were out there uh, running around, taking videos of things, uh, uh, you know. And uh, they had some pretty dramatic experiences, that team, uh, with their camera equipment. At one point, uh, uh, I remember uh, a helicopter came out and they had tried to get as close in as they could on one of the dirt roads and uh, to the actual real limit. And there were the uh, the Wacken Hut dudes out there, and they uh, the trucks started coming towards them. So they turned around, started heading out down this road. This helicopter comes and actually comes down right over the car, and actually starts bouncing on the car's roof with its skid, right, and brings that car to a stop. Wow, you saw that? Uh, well, I saw the video, of that part of it, and I had, and the audio of the people inside the car. Yeah, and that video is available. I, I, I don't know if Don has it. Or, I, wow, but, I've never seen that. I uh, yeah. yeah, send me a link, man. Well, <laughs> I don't have a link, but if I can find it, I'll let you know. Maybe but, yeah, post uh, it on Hakao YouTube. Will, Norio will. If you go on Facebook to Norio and ask him about it, he'll be able to tell you about that. Maybe post report, it on Facebook so everybody on the planet can see it. That would be fun. Yeah, Norio could probably do that because I think it's his, his footage. But this was, uh, you know, with this Japanese uh, camera team. And what Mike Younger pointed out to us and said to me before I went out there, he said, do you know where uh, the headquarters for Nippon Television is? It's in the palace, in the Imperial Palace. Oh, boy, we're going to have to just break right here with that cliffhanger in the Imperial Palace. We have the Imperial, or not Imperious, Imperial Richard Saradet with Gene and Chris. You're in the Pentecost. <laughs> Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. If you want to get your website online and you need reliable service, first-class service at the lowest possible price, there's only one place to go. Well, DreamHost has a special promotion with our show where they'll offer you unlimited disk space, unlimited bandwidth, one-click web app such as WordPress, 24-7 support. You can save over $55. You want to know how? Go to DreamHost.com slash radio, DreamHost.com slash radio. Web whether it's personal mail, whether it's business email, you want reliable, dependable delivery, freedom from spam, freedom from viruses. Well, Polaris Mail offers professional email hosting services for your personal or small business use. Each account uses 25 gigabytes of storage, an easy-to-use webmail interface, and full mobile sync. Sign up today for a 30-day free trial at PolarisMail.com, PolarisMail.com. That's what it sounds like when a burglar kicks in the door of a dark house that looks like no one is home. Don't let your home be the next target. Make it look like someone is home watching television with fake TV. Fake TV is a small electronic device that makes the same light as a real television. So from outside, it looks like someone is home watching TV. Fake TV plugs in just like a lamp on a timer, but is far more convincing to burglars. Fake TV deters burglars, costs far less than an alarm, and is highly recommended by numerous police departments. Use it anytime you're away from home. To order your fake TV for only $34.95, go to faketv.com or call one 877 fake tv Each additional fake TV is only $29.95. So get one for you and one for a loved one. For safety, security, and peace of mind for both of you. Call 877-5-F-A-K-E-TV or go to faketv.com. Faketv.com, the burglar deterrent. What's better than Mountain House freeze-dried food? Buckets of Mountain House freeze-dried food. Now the freeze-dry guy introduces convenient, easy-to-store Mountain House survival buckets filled with our top-selling items. Each item is sealed in a Mylar-type pouch, and each pouch is neatly packed in clear buckets so you can easily see the contents inside. These Mountain House survival buckets come with well over a 25-year shelf life and are perfect for emergency preparedness, camping, backpacking, or at-home use. Go to freeze-dryguy.com, click on freeze-dried foods, and choose our 12-month 
six-month, three-month, one-month, or seven-day Mountain House Survival Bucket with 32 generous servings starting at just $69.95. And all orders to the lower 48 ship free. Call 866-404-3663 or go to freezedryguy.com. That's 866-404-3663 or go to freezedryguy.com. 100% veteran-owned. The Freeze Dry Guy. Since 1974, Evelyn Gibson has helped thousands of people live healthier, happier, and more productive lives. Gibson'sHealth.com demonstrates, educates, and inspires customers to replace their healthy roast of lifestyles with a health-enhancing one. Now, Gibson'sHealth.com is pleased to offer AIM Ready Beets Pure Juice Powder. Beet juice has long been known as a blood purifier and builder of red blood cells. The American Heart Association says one in three adults has high blood pressure and hypertension. Researchers found that a daily glass of beet juice beats high blood pressure and not only that just a teaspoon or two a day of ready beets powder increased stamina by 16 percent certainly drinking beet juice daily is a better solution than most meds with their side effects order your fresh convenient form juice powder of this amazing vegetable called ready beets from gibsonshealth.com to buy at wholesale prices call 800-388-6844 or go to gibsonshealth.com gibson's healthful living since 1974 over 30,000 healthier customers Hi, this is Nick Pope. You're listening to the Paracast. That is an accent that is not just imperial. I don't want to get into it because... You sound a little vaguely like uh, the Transylvanian dude. Possibly, yes. Actually, you just sounded like Norio. (laughs) I'll have to work on that. Well, Norio is going to call us now. He's been on the show. We have Richard Saradet, who is going to regale you with all the voices that he does. (laughs) <laughs> for the rest of the show, the remaining 10 or 11 minutes of the show, with Gene and Chris on the PowerCast. He's the quiet researcher coming forth about, first, Dr. Carla Turner, and we were focusing on possible government disinformation involved there, also with regard to the strange story of Bob Lazar, what he's all about. Now, I did this a few times in the show. I got myself in trouble, and I'll do it again, okay? Because I've been in so much trouble on the show. Mm. Really, I've become the... Paracast Soap Opera in Chief. <laughs> Wait a minute. You can't claim that title. I thought it was me. I'm the one that's always in trouble. You get off scot-free. What are you talking about? Oh, right, right. Especially after I added that strange license plate to my car. We'll get into that later. We don't want Richard to ask what that's all about. I'm going to. But I have a question for you first. There was somebody who posted right away after I did called Paranormal Trollop or something. Did you see those posts? And she kind of like, the first thing was the Boy. biggest show. Uh, yeah, like, we've, we've the under the bridge crowd has uh, kind of invaded the show the last week. It it's kind of disconcerting. Yeah, what's going on? Yeah. I was like, what the hell are you? Th- yeah, this fifty one percent of uh, uh, the time is advertising. It's like, well, uh, yeah, uh, that's something you should comment on. I mean, you okay, know, but you know what's interesting about it? somebody actually put that up. Mm-hmm. Half the show is advertising now. Duh. What's really crazy here is. And I always wonder about this. The Paracast is a network radio show, and we follow what they call the clear channel model of commercial breaks. Right. So, therefore, we have roughly two hours of material on a show that lasts two hours and 39 minutes, which is, what, 25 or 26 percent commercials. Now, this is pretty strict. I mean, we're not the only one who does that. The same schedule is adhered to with Coast to Coast. We have Randy Rhodes, the liberal, Rush Limbaugh, the conservative, Hundreds of radio shows around the USA have exactly the same number of commercials as we do. Now, yeah, I guess we can all say we'd like to see less. And it is less than it used to be. Radio shows used to have more commercials than they do now. We'd like to see less, but, of course, a network has to make a buck. So there you go. Hold on one second. It's not the number of commercials. It's It's the actual commercial time. Our show has a lot of small 15-second commercials, so it seems like a lot longer. Yeah, and the reason they do that is a sponsor will learn that they can get a really good rate on 15-second commercials, and the network says, well, four 15-second commercials make them a lot more money than a single couple of 30 seconds or a full minute Mm. because of the way the rates break down. That's why you have the problem. But I can't control what the network does. Our commercials, the ones that we're paid for, they're 30 seconds or 60 seconds flat. That's how you go. But it's yeah, a crazy so, world out there. And, that, and that's, that's just definitely a troll, like what a useless comment. You wonder also, when, since we're talking about government disinformation here, and that is 
I wonder what sort of possibility is there that a widely trafficked forum, like the Paracast Community Forums, whether some of the people hanging out there are government agents. Well, what do you think? I mean, if you were in their position and had to monitor this uh, subject and uh, perhaps influence it, uh, you know, it might be a classification. That's your job. It's like 11 Bravo, you know, infantry. You know. Uh, my first assignment, if I had followed through with Army Security Agency and gone to the uh, language school in Monterey and learned 47 weeks uh, uh, course in German, to you, to you not only speak it like a native, but you recognize all the regional accents, etc., the first thing Simon and I would have had would have been sitting on the edge of East Germany on the West German side with a pair of earphones on, listening to everything. That would have been my first job, you know. So, yeah, they monitor. I mean, the government monitors everything it needs to monitor. And they're not using the machine that's available in that TV series, Person of Interest, or are they? How close to the truth is there about a universal computer that tracks everyone. Well, before we even go there, Gene, I, I think the very fact that the Paracast has uh, drawn out some of the more, um, well, in three years, I haven't seen the kinds of trolls that have, that have turned up recently that, uh, that we have. And I think that, to me, is actually a compliment because it indicates to me that we're getting maybe uncomfortably close to the core of certain subjects, and uh, that tends to ratchet up the heat in the response. And that, that's just a, a possibility. I'm not saying that's so, but, but I take it as a, as a, uh, as a compliment uh, that these uh, trolls have come out and really tried to attack the show uh, and attacked us personally. Oh, I've seen a lot of that over the years. And one of the reasons is one of the things that differentiates the Paracast and you know shows like... Radio Mysterioso and Dark Matters is the fact that we're not afraid to ask questions. Just ask questions. Somebody says something, and we say, okay, what's your basis for that? Very simple questions we ask, basic questions that any journalist should ask about someone. And if we have evidence that someone's being deceptive, we will present it. But a lot of 